Uh, good morning. Uh, the hearing will come to order. Uh, just a few months ago in testimony before this committee, Secretary Sebelius repeatedly told Congress and the American people that the Obama uh, administration was, on, and I'm quoting, was on track to meet the October 1 deadline, end quote, for the new health care law. However, over the past two months, the evidence shows just the opposite is true. In June, the Government Accountability Office released two reports which raised serious questions about whether the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, would be able to have federally run exchanges up and running by October 1, 2013, noting numerous reasons for their concerns. In late July, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration stated that testing for the exchanges would be difficult to complete before the October 1 date and as a result, Americans will see significant delays and errors. Right before the July 4th holiday, the administration announced by blog post a delay of a major provision of the law, the employer mandate, giving employers relief but doing nothing to aid hardworking Americans. Three days later, Health and Human Services announced they would rely on self-verification when it comes to who gets subsidies. And just this week, we learned that by delaying the mandate, another $12 billion will be added to the deficit. It will also increase federal spending by a total of $3 billion in new exchange subsidies because the delay will result in fewer employers offering coverage. With these facts at hand, you'll have to forgive me if I'm skeptical of the claims that everything is, quote, on track. It's been over three years since the law was passed, and in just 60 days, the exchanges are due to be up and running but we still do not have answers to many crucial questions, and worse yet, neither do the American people. How is the average hardworking taxpayer expected to navigate the Obamacare exchanges in just a few short months when the administration has provided no information as to what the real cost will be or what their health insurance will look like? To quote one of my Democratic colleagues, when is the White House going to actually get up and go? As though the concerns and questions about implementation weren't enough, almost daily we're reminded of the effects the law is having on the economy. Businesses are struggling to figure out how to comply with the law, how it will affect their business, and, how, and whether they will have to cut hours, wages, or jobs in order to comply. After the administration announced the employer mandate delay, one small business owner testified before this committee that, as a business owner, I worked on the 4th of July and I worried about it and I fielded calls from other franchisees asking what this meant on the 4th of July. Our job creators and their employees deserve better. The uncertainty is growing all over the country and the American people need answers to the questions that millions of families and individuals are asking. Why are my premiums skyrocketing? How can I expand my business, hire new workers, give employees a raise when I'm being hit with all these new mandates, regulations, and red tape? Why am I losing the insurance I have and like? And as, and as if college students were not already struggling with gym, dim job prospects upon graduation, the health care law is placing an even greater burden on the young. Central Michigan University, a university in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, just announced that they will have to limit college student work hours to 25 hours a week. As one student said, students use that money to pay for finances in school, and I think it's going to become increasingly harder for them to pay for school when we can only work 25 hours. And as if Americans didn't have reason enough to fear the IRS, we now know that it's in no position to implement the 47 new powers and authority given to it under the health care law. In fact, it's likely Americans will be at even greater risk of having their identity stolen or private taxpayer information leaked as a result of the law. Even the Treasury's Inspector General less than two weeks ago stated the IRS will struggle to complete all required testing. The Inspector General is not confident about the IRS's ability to protect confidential taxpayer information or to prevent fraud, and neither am I. This law is becoming increasingly unfair, unworkable, and untenable for Americans. With just three months left, patients, doctors, and hardworking taxpayers will have more questions than answers. I look forward to hearing an honest, straightforward assessment of the status of this law from our witnesses this morning. And with that, I'll yield to Mr. Levin for his opening statement. Well, welcome to the two of you. We look forward to your testimony uh, to dispel uh, so much of what has been said. Today, the committee's holding a hearing entitled The Status of the Affordable Care Act's Implementation under the pretense, the pretense, that House Republicans are interested in implementation of the landmark law. 
The truth is just the opposite. It's evidenced by what House Republicans plan to do in just 40, 24 hours. They're going to push a bill through the House entitled, Keep the IRS Off Your Health Care Act. It would prohibit any funding, any funding for the IRS to implement the Affordable Care Act. I don't know how more negative, destructive you can be than that. House Republicans have made plain over the last three years that their sole interest, their sole interest, is to disrupt the law's implementation. Tomorrow's vote will be their last action, their last action, before adjourning for a five-week recess, a fitting sign-off for a conference whose singular obsession with the health law's repeal over the last three years has come at the expense of so many other issues that are critically important to American families and the overall economy. By the time they leave here Friday for summer recess, Republicans will have voted no fewer than 40 times to repeal Obamacare. The Republican mission is clear. Don't implement, destroy. How else can Republicans explain why they've occupied so much time and wasted countless taxpayer dollars on 40 repeal votes that stand no chance of being enacted while refusing to go to conference to enact a budget into law? How else can they explain why they have leaned on outside organizations, including the National Football League, to discourage them from helping to e educate Americans about current law health insurance opportunities and assistance that will be available through the marketplace? And how else can they explain why they have worked so hard to discourage states from expanding their Medicaid programs, even when fully federally funded, which will prevent millions of the most vulnerable Americans from gaining access to health care coverage. At every turn, Republicans have chosen the path of disruption, and it's so vividly on display this week as they have sought to deny the Obama administration funding needed to implement. How can you say you're interested in implementation when you try to destroy the funding? If Republicans were truly interested in the Affordable Care Act's implementation, they would inform their constituents that a simple three-page application awaits single Americans purchasing insurance on the exchange. And that neither, and I emphasize this, and I hope the witnesses will speak to this, and neither the IRS nor the Department of Health and Human Services will have access to medical records or other personal history. Instead, what do we see? Scare tactics and other misguided efforts to convince constituents that applying for health care coverage will be time consuming and cumbersome. We've known for quite a while the Republicans have no interest in ensuring that Americans understand what even Speaker Boehner himself has acknowledged, and that is ACA is the law of the land. Their only interest is to misinform, misconstrue, and mislead the American public about ACA. Even conservative Republican Senator Ted Cruz chastised the Republican effort in the House this week. He said, and I quote, there are a lot of, of politicians in Washington who love empty symbolic votes. The House has voted, what, 39, 40, 41 times? I can't keep track to repeal Obamacare. Those votes were by and large empty symbolic votes that had zero chance of passing, end of quotes. The problem is, in a sense, they're not symbolic. They're part of a destructive mission. So thank you to both of you for coming today. And all of us look forward to your testimony.
we're sure that you will tell the facts and tell them emphatically. I also want to ask unanimous consent that the following article from the American Enterprise Institute's Norm Morenstein be inserted in the record. Without objection. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Levin. Now it's my pleasure to welcome our two witnesses, both of whom bring a great deal of experience and hopefully a good amount of answers from the administration. First, I'd like to welcome Gary Cohen, the Deputy Administrator and Director for the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, or CSIO, at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And second, we will hear from Daniel Werfel, the Principal Deputy Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner for Services and Enforcement at the IRS. Again, thank you both for being with us today. The committee has received each of your written statements, and they'll be made part of the formal record. Each of you will be recognized for five minutes for your oral remarks, and then we'll go to questions from the members of the committee. And Mr. Cohen, we'll begin with you. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Camp, Ranking Member Levin, and members of the committee. Since the Affordable Care Act became law, CMS has been hard at work implementing the law's strong consumer protections that hold insurance companies more accountable, give consumers more coverage options, and improve the value of that coverage. And of course, it's not just CMS that's hard at work implementing this law. Thousands of people all across the country are hard at work to make sure that Americans will receive the benefits of a transformed health insurance market. They are employees of health plans who are designing new products that provide greater value and security to consumers. They are the staff at state insurance departments who are reviewing those products to make sure that the rates charged are fair and reasonable. They are people in communities in every state all across the country who are preparing to help people enroll in coverage beginning in October. Most Americans receive health insurance in connection with their jobs. And for those Americans, particularly those who work for larger employers, the system has worked well. But for the approximately 15% of Americans who don't have coverage through their employer or Medicare or Medicaid or CHIP or some other government program, the system has been broken. Before the Affordable Care Act, many young people and those with low incomes could not afford health insurance, leaving millions without coverage. Women could be charged 50% more than men for individual insurance policies. Insurance was not affordable for many small employers because of the type of work that they do or because they have one worker with high medical costs. Now Americans are benefiting from some of the Affordable Care Act's insurance reforms. More than 3 million additional young adults under the age of 26 are covered under their parents' plans. Nearly 18 million children with pre-existing conditions now cannot be denied coverage. New scrutiny of health insurance rate increases has saved Americans an estimated $1 billion on their health insurance premiums. And in 2014, being a woman will no longer be a pre-existing condition. Two months from today, the marketplaces will provide a new way to shop for coverage for the uninsured, those with pre-existing conditions, and individuals who currently buy coverage at high cost. On October 1st, Americans will begin shopping in the marketplaces, and they'll be able to fill out one application to purchase private insurance, qualify for premium tax credits and reduced cost sharing, or obtain Medicaid or CHIP coverage. Many of the Americans who will shop in the marketplaces have never had health insurance, so the process of selecting, applying, and enrolling in health coverage will be unfamiliar to them. To reach these populations, CMS is providing outreach, education, and enrollment assistance in a variety of ways. In June, we relaunched a new consumer-focused healthcare.gov website and a 24-hour-a-day call center to help Americans prepare for open enrollment and ultimately to sign up for private health insurance. Since then, thousands of consumers have contacted us via live web chat or our toll-free number and healthcare.gov already has had over one million visitors. Consumers in the marketplaces will also be able to get in-person help from navigators, in-person assisters, trusted people connected to their community who can help them walk through the process of applying for coverage. They can also work with insurance agents and brokers, uh, as is true in the market today, to select a qualified health plan. These insurance plans in the marketplace will be affordable. In fact, we are already seeing evidence that the marketplaces are encouraging insurers to compete for consumers on price. For the federally facilitated marketplaces, CMS has received qualified health plan submissions from more than 120 issuers. In 11 states, preliminary rates are lower than expected, 18% less than what the CBO estimated. In some cases, rates are lower than the current premiums consumers are paying today. And some states have released initial bids only to have insurers request to amend those bids to make them lower in order to be more competitive. 
This is good news for consumers, many of whom will be able to afford health insurance for the first time. And many consumers will be eligible for help with premiums and their out-of-pocket costs through advanced payment of premium tax credits and cost-sharing reductions. CMS has already finished developing most of the services required to support open enrollment, including the Data Hub, a routing tool that helps verify income, citizenship status, and other information consumers provide against existing data sources. The marketplace will be up and running on October 1, when million, millions more Americans will have access to high quality, more affordable health coverage. By making coverage more affordable, improving the value of insurance coverage, and protecting consumers, CMS is paving the way for fairer, more transparent, and more accessible health insurance marketplaces. I thank you for the opportunity to discuss CMS's important work to improve access to affordable health coverage for all Americans and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Werfel, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Camp, Ranking Member Levin, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the work the IRS has been doing to fulfill our responsibilities under the Affordable Care Act. The IRS is charged with implementing the tax-related provisions of the ACA. Our most substantial implementation effort in this regard involves the delivery of the premium tax credits that will help millions of American families afford health insurance starting in 2014 when the new health insurance marketplace, also known as affordable insurance exchanges, will begin operating. The Department of Health and Human Services is the lead agency on defining the structure and operations of the marketplace. Open enrollment for insurance purchased through the marketplace will start October 1, 2013, with coverage beginning as soon as January 1, 2014. When an individual seeks to purchase insurance through a marketplace and seeks financial assistance, the marketplace must determine what assistance, if any, the applicant may qualify for, such as Medicaid or the premium tax credit. To make that determination, the marketplace will request federal taxpayer data from us and we will provide for each applicant some limited tax data from the applicant's most recently filed federal income tax return. It is important to understand exactly how this information will be transferred from the IRS to the marketplace. The ACA designates HHS as the conduit for information being shared with the marketplace. The taxpayer data supplied by the IRS will be transmitted over secure, encrypted channels to the HHS Federal Data Services Hub, which was developed to facilitate these data transfers. This data hub will not be storing taxpayer information, but merely routing that information to authorized users. At no time is the tax data to be, to be displayed to anyone outside of the marketplace itself. The IRS also is responsible for providing a computational service if the marketplace determines that the applicant is eligible for and interested in advance payments of the premium tax credit, which are sent to the individual's insurance company. Without identifying the applicant, the marketplace will submit a few data elements, including income and family size, for the IRS computational service through the HHS data hub and receive back a single figure. That figure represents the maximum advance premium tax credit resulting from those data inputs. Nothing in this computational process identifies individuals or contains tax data. While the focus for October 2013 is on preparing for the marketplaces to begin operating, the IRS has also been preparing for the 2015 filing season. Beginning with the 2014 tax returns filed in 2015, eligible individuals will be able to claim the credit on their returns and will be required to reconcile any advances already paid to their insurance company on their behalf. In regard to these taxpayers, the IRS must balance the need to promptly process accurate returns with the need to identify and stop any erroneous claims for the credit. To facilitate this process, the marketplaces will be sending to the IRS enrollment information for individuals purchasing coverage through those marketplaces. This transactional information will be transmitted over secure encrypted channels. It will include the fact and cost of coverage and information on any advance payments of the premium tax credit made during the coverage year to the taxpayer's insurance company on their behalf. While certain identifying information, such as name and social security number, is required to support the processing of returns, no personal health information will ever be provided. 
the IRS will reconcile the information with what the individuals, individuals report on their tax returns so that the IRS can verify whether they receive the proper amount of credit, are owed more, or must repay any excess advance payments. This information will help the IRS speed processing of returns and spot erroneous credit claims. It is important to note that the IRS already routinely receives third-party information that helps it verify the accuracy of tax returns, and we have long-standing policies in place related to the safety and privacy of this information. We will use this experience to guide us in making sure that any ACA-related ta taxpayer information we receive is properly safeguarded. In addition to the data, tools, and systems that the IRS uses to battle tax fraud of all kinds, we have some particular tools for enforcing proper payments of the premium tax credit. As mentioned above, the marketplaces will be providing the IRS with key 2014 transactional data prior to the beginning of the 2015 tax filing season. Having this pre-positioned enrollment data will allow the IRS to more effectively detect erroneous claims for the credit. Chairman Camp, Ranking Member Levin, that concludes my statement. I would be happy to take your questions. Well, thank you both very much. Um, Mr. Werfel, as you know, the committee's long been concerned about the uh, integrity of the use of taxpayer dollars and, and the IRS's ability to control abuse of uh, those dollars. In fact, the one of the Treasury's inspectors general, and that is obviously the independent nonpartisan watchdog of the IRS and the Treasury, has previously reported massive amounts of improper payments. Um, and those are pay under payments under the IRS's authority. In fact, a report last year by this nonpartisan inspector general s estimated the IRS will issue over $21 billion in fraudulent tax refunds over a five-year period. And more recently, the inspector general found that the IRS allowed $46 million in fraudulent tax refunds to go to a single mailing address in Georgia. Now, this comes on the heels of a 2010 Inspector General report, so this is not a new development, that reported the IRS would issue 55 to $65 billion in improper EITC payments before it could enact efforts to stop this fraud. Uh, these are issues I've raised with your predecessor for a number of years as well, and obviously these facts are very troubling. Now, that same nonpartisan Inspector General testified and I quote, the IRS's existing fraud detection systems may not be capable of identifying ACA or health care refund or fraud schemes prior to the issuance of the tax refunds, end quote. Obviously, this is completely unacceptable, and I, I, I guess I would ask, um, how do you expect the American people to believe that their hard-earned tax dollars are going to be protected, and what are you doing about these long-standing ongoing problems? And obviously the potential in the future, given the Inspector General's testimony. Well, thank you for the question. I have a few responses. First, I think we could have a separate discussion um, about uh, fraud and improper payments in other parts of the tax code, like the Earned Income Tax Credit. But let me spend some time on the Affordable Care Act. There's some differences with the way the Affordable Care Act uh, and the IRS footprint works from EITC that I think is important to point out because it actually is helpful in reducing the incidence of fraud. And there's two key things I want to share with you. First, when an individual comes in to get uh, premium tax credit assistance, so where they're getting their tax credit under the ACA, no funds are actually shared directly with the taxpayer. That money goes to the insurance company. So that individual is never receiving the money. They're getting an economic benefit, access to insurance and, and less expensive premiums. But different from EITC where they're actually getting the money. here. But whether they qualify for the benefit will be up to them, right? Because now HHS has said they will self-authenticate or self-verify. They will say whether they qualify, correct? Well, we're going to, as, as I mentioned in my, in my opening remarks, we provide HHS and then they provide the marketplace taxpayer information about those individuals and their income level. So but that, at the time, that information will help validate what their income may be in the future based on having that historical information of what their taxpayer data says now. But I am correct on the self-authentication or self-verify that taxpayers will determine whether they qualify. I'll leave that question for, for Mr. Cohen, but let me add one. Mr. Cohen, am I correct on that? No, we are going to verify the uh, income that uh, of every person who applies for uh, uh, subsidies 
uh, through the marketplaces. And we're going to do that through... But wait, just stop for a second. HHS announced that there's going to be a self-verification system. Did they not make that announcement? We, we have, uh, we're actually going to be coming out with some additional guidance today, I think, uh, or tomorrow. Okay, but they did make that quick. announcement. We, we, we said that we were going to be doing a sampling, and we are now going to be announcing that we are going to be sampling 100 percent. We are going to be ex requesting documentation. So there's new information that... There's new information. Correct. And can you elaborate on that for I us? I can. I can. So the way it's going to work is people say, this is how much my income was, or is going to be. And that, uh, what the person puts on the application is checked against av available data sources from IRS, from Social Security in the event that they have disability income, and from uh, Equifax, which is a well-known private company. But you're not going to have their current taxpayer information until after they file. If we, no, this is so they'll, they'll be looking at the prior year's tax return. So Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so, so that'll if, be. if we can't match, if there isn't a match, if we can't verify, then we are going to ask for further information and documentation, right. such as pay stubs, from every applicant. All right. And I'm wondering if you continue. There was just one other thing I wanted to add. In addition to the fact that the taxpayer itself does not receive funds, just receives the economic benefit because the money goes direct to the insurance company. The other point is that the IRS... But they do get the subsidy. They get a subsidy, but they never get cash in hand. They get a cheaper... No, but in terms of the American taxpayer being protected from improper or fraudulent subsidies, that still is an outstanding issue. Whether the individual gets a cash payment or not, there still is a... Completely a, agree. If there's a mistake there, it's you. a loss to the Treasury. Uh, but here's which is the American point. people. Right. Absolutely. I, I agree. But I, if I can make one more point, which is the IRS will have a report from the exchange, and that will report will have detailed information will, that will let us validate, does this, informa does this individual have a relationship with the exchange? We'll know the, whether they've made their premium tax credit, uh, made their premium payments. We'll have more information to reconcile that individual's tax return than we have in EITC and other cases. So there are some mitigating elements that will help us reduce the incidence of potential erroneous payments in this case. Will the IRS enforce the mandate that businesses offer acceptable coverage next year? Uh, so here's how that's going to work. Um, what you're, I think what you're referring to is that uh, we, um, in future years, after the 15 filing season, will rely on an employer report, and that employer report will not be provided in this first but year. But next year, yes Next or year, no. we are working on solutions to look at other alternative reports and information to help validate the employer offer. And that's kind of under development right now with the employer community, with the business community, in, in, in the light of the fact that the employer report is not going to occur until filing season 2016. We're working with employers now to look at alternative ways to validate their offer of coverage. Well, I did I not read the blog post properly that the employer mandate was delayed? It, the, yes, there's a, a, um, a what we're calling the transition relief period, and in that case, the which means it's delayed for a year. Yes, and the employer so, right, and the employer report that was due in filing season 15 is now going to be due in filing season 16. But that doesn't mean we're not going to continue to work with businesses to understand what types of offer of health coverage. But next year, the employer mandate will not be enforced. That is correct. That's the conclusion. Thank you for that. That is correct. But, I do believe the IRS will enforce the individual mandate that average Americans have acceptable coverage next year. Is that correct? Yes, the individual mandate is still in place. So, I mean, one of the um, comments from the Inspector General for Tax Administration said that the IRS will need to ensure that tax returns accurately claim the various applicable ACA provisions and, above all, that taxpayers are treated fairly. And I guess my question for you is, is it fair that businesses, big businesses, are off the hook while the average taxpayer is going to be required to buy federally defined acceptable coverage through an individual mandate? How fair is that? Well, I, I, you know, my role in the IRS is to implement uh, the laws. Uh, I rely on the Treasury Department to make certain decisions uh, that are of a policy nature. I think the decision here and the issue of fairness and equity is a policy call that the Treasury Department made. I believe there's a balancing that goes on in terms of making sure that we're implementing the, the law as effectively right. as possible. The employers and the business community reached out, uh, indicated a need for more time. 
um, and there was a balancing decision made that we should provide them that more time. All right. Thank you. And, and Mr. Cohen, I, I, I appreciate your um, openness about what HHS may be doing, and I think it just underscores how important this oversight hearing is on implementation as we're seeing new developments on a daily basis in this area. So I think any concern that this is an, an unnecessary or uh, hearing, I think, are certainly waved away by your comments. But let me just say that um, you've seen the rate filings for the plans being offered in the 34 federal exchanges, have you not? We have uh, had submissions from the issuers that will be offering in the federal facility. And, and they've come to you because that's your responsibility. They've come to my office, yes. yes. Um, but we obviously haven't seen them, and the American people haven't seen them. Um, so my question to you is, will the average family in mid and northern Michigan see a $2,500 reduction in the premiums they pay? I, I you know, we are, haven't released any data on uh, the rates that have come into the federally facilitated marketplace. We are very careful at CMS, just as we do uh, with uh, the Part D program and the Medicare Advantage program. We only release that information once well, we have a, an agreement. We don't want to affect the market. Well, the president promised that we'll lower premiums, I'm quoting, up to $2,500 for a typical family per year, end quote. Is that going to happen? And obviously we're a couple of months away from this being implemented. People are concerned about what their costs, how they're going to be able to meet these obligations. Is the average family in mid and northern Michigan going to see that kind of rate reduction? I think that the uh, average family in mid to northern Michigan will have in a marketplace more options and for better coverage at an affordable price. Uh, once the Affordable Care Act is... Uh, so they will see a $2,500 reduction. I, I, I can't say. We're not releasing well, any information well, about certainly the data, you can so. understand why citizens are concerned uh, on what is going to be a very large expense for their families. It, they, we can't even have any sort of prediction in terms of where this is going to be after several years of so-called implementation. I actually think that predictions uh, have proven not to be very useful. I think it would be more useful to look at the rates that states have actually released um, which uh, have in, in uh, the 11 states. But given the numbers you've seen, have you seen on average a $2,500 reduction? We, we, we have seen a reduction um, if you compare apples to apples coverage in a number of cases, yes, we have seen a reduction. So in the rate. average family, you've seen a $2,500 reduction? I, I can't speak to $2,500 specifically. I mean, that's yes. what the president promised. Well, I'm not sure that's exactly what the president said, but I'll... I'm quoting from him. Are you suggesting I'm not quoting him accurately? Uh, I, 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 I'm not I suggesting anything. certainly hope anything. not. I, 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 am, I am not suggesting that at all. I'm just saying right. I'm not sure what the president said. All right. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Levin. Oh, well, here we go. Um, president, I think, talked about up to. As long as you've raised Michigan, let me just tell you what's happening. 14 insurance carriers have now submitted to be participants in the marketplace in Michigan. 14. When Blue Cross Blue Shield has had 60, 70 percent a dominant role in the insurance industry in Michigan. That's a fact. And for Republicans who say they believe in competition, essentially that's what this marketplace is going to bring about for the citizens of Michigan, including in central Michigan. Uh, Mr. Werfel, um, if 2009 is passed tomorrow and becomes law, would uh, IRS be able to implement uh, the Affordable Care Act? If my understanding of the law, we would not because we would not have the ability to expend any resources to do our implementation efforts. It, totally destructive. It won't happen. Uh, let me ask each of you, if I might, uh, will your agency be ready to go on October 1, Mr. Cohn? Yes, we will. Mr. Werfel, assuming 2009 doesn't pass. Yes, we will. Uh, will consumers be able to begin enrolling in the exchange or marketplace coverage on October 1? Yes, they will. Will that coverage start on January 1 of, of 2014? Yes, it will. 
Mr. Werfel, there's been a lot of scare tactics about mm -hmm. taxpayer data, and I just want to read to you from your testimony. At no time is the tax data to be displayed to anyone outside of the marketplace. Is that your assurance? Yes. I mean, there's a, a, a set of procedures that we have put in place to make sure that there is clarity on when and how the taxpayer information is transmitted. It's transmitted over encrypted channels. There's all types of safeguards and procedures that we put in place when we share taxpayer information outside of the IRS, which happens um, now for programs like Medicaid and other programs. We're using those same set of procedures, which have historically proven effective. They're not perfect, but they've proven historically very effective in mitigating the risk of any taxpayer information being used or accessed for unauthorized purposes. And thank you. If either of you could comment on this, describe how, how this bill will affect millions of middle class individuals and families who have been waiting for premium assistance when the marketplace opens on October 1. Would you like to answer that? Uh, thank you. So I, I would say in two ways. I think one very important way is that um, today it is for anyone who has a, an illness or has had an illness in the past, it can be difficult or impossible to get health insurance coverage because the, uh, they either will be ineligible for it or it will be much too expensive because they'll be rated up because of their existing medical condition. That can't happen uh, uh, with coverage beginning January 1st. Um, the second way is that for many people it's simply been unaffordable um, because of their income level uh, and for those people uh, there will be both, uh, as uh, Mr. Werfel has explained, uh, advanced premium tax credits that will go directly to the insurance company to offset a portion of the premium and there will also be a reduction in what they have to pay in cost sharing in terms of deductible and co-pays um, that will be paid directly to the insurance company to make the coverage affordable. Thank you. I yield back. All right. Mr. Johnson's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, the Supreme Court stated very clearly, quote, Americans have a choice. They can either buy government-approved health insurance or they can choose not to and instead pay a penalty. That choice is never mentioned in the application, is it? No, the application is, asks people whether they want to apply and whether they want to get financial assistance uh, purchasing coverage. So, But it never says they don't have to do it if they don't want to. Well, it doesn't say that they have to do it either. It just is available to people who choose to come I think to, you need to the market. To that. The website, www.healthcare.gov, does not alert Americans that the Supreme Court says they have a choice. I don't think your website does that either, does it? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware, but I, it doesn't surprise me if it doesn't. I don't think it tells people that they have to either. I think it offers opportunities for people to Will purchase insurance in a private market. Will navigators be required to inform individuals that they do have a choice? They don't have to take the insurance if they don't want it? I think our goal is to get as many Americans insured in health coverage as we can, Congressman, because I think that uh, that provides a security to their families and help uh, if they become ill. Well, how, how are Americans going to be told they don't have, have to do this if they don't want to? Well, I think there are folks out there who are probably telling them that, but I'm not sure that's my job. It is your job. Uh, Mr. Werfel, last week your employees who are a member of the National Treasury Employees Union sent a form letter for union members to send in to ask they be exempt from the exchanges. Why are your employees trying to exempt themselves from the very law that you're tasked to enforce? Well, I don't want to speak for the NTEU, but I'll offer a perspective as a federal employee myself and a federal employee at the IRS. And that is, uh, we have right now, as employees of the government of the IRS, affordable health care coverage. And I think the ACA was designed to provide an option or an alternative for individuals that do not. And all else being equal, I think if you're an individual who's satisfied with your health care coverage, uh, you're probably in a better position to stick with that coverage than go through the change of moving into a different environment and going through that process. So I think for a federal employee, um, I think more likely, and I would, can speak for myself, I'd prefer to stay with the current policy that I'm pleased with rather than 
uh, go through a change if I don't need to go through that change. Um, and, but if I'm an individual that doesn't have affordable health care coverage or I'm unhappy with my coverage, then it's my understanding the exchanges would offer a competitive alternative to look at, and that might be something someone might want to pursue. But I think the IRS employees as a whole, I think what the NTU is saying is they're pleased with their health care coverage. They prefer to stay in their current health care coverage. Well, do they have to pay a penalty then for not taking government coverage? No, the, it's my understanding that the individual mandate would only occur if they're not getting coverage at all. If they opt for no coverage, then they would pay uh, the individual mandate. Okay, I'm, I, I don't read it that way. Uh, Mr. Werfel, Mr. Cohen, I've got a question about fairness. Until July the 2nd, the administration was telling individuals who work more than 30 hours a week, we're going to make your employer provide your health care. If they don't, you can get health care and a subsidy in the exchange. Now, that's not true any longer for 2014. An employer does not have to offer coverage, so the individuals will have to go to the exchange in 2014 to get coverage. Uh, many have already sent, seen their hours slashed as businesses attempt to comply with the 30-hour rule, and it's kind of confusing and disrupting. Uh, the fact is Obamacare is not ready, and it is the American people who bear the burden of you not being ready. Is that fair for employers and their employees? Either one of you. Well, I would just say, first of all, that um, the requirement that employers provide coverage under the Affordable Care Act when it goes into effect a year from now only applies to larger employers, 96 percent of which provide coverage to their workers today. So the impact of that provision is actually quite small. Uh, smaller employers were not subject to the employer mandate under the Affordable Care Act before, and they won't be next year. So um, th there's a lot of misunderstanding about, you know, what this provision is and who it impacts. Um, the, it's, so I, I think I would stop there. Right, and as I said earlier, um, I, think, I think on July 17th, uh, a Treasury Department official, Mark Ivory, appeared here and answered these very questions. I think it's more appropriate for me to focus on the administration of these provisions and how effective uh, the IRS can be in administrating these, uh, these issues. All right. Thank you. Mr. Rangel. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. and welcome to the battlefield. Bring your mic on. Right. I don't is your Listen, mic on? The people are yeah. talking about states, and I know that I'm always over, overconfident about the successes of New York City and New York State, but it was my last reading that as relates to the cost of, of health insurance in New York State that it was far more favorable than what was perceived by our chairman. Could you share with me? Is my observations accurate? That's right. New York has published uh, rates that have been proposed to be uh, in effect in 2014, and they are lower for um, most people than the rates that were in effect uh, this And year. in this great country, we do have other examples of states that really want to provide services for uh, their citizens that they're just as positive. Is that not true? That's correct. Now, it's abundantly clear that this hearing is being called not to be of any assistance in this program being successful. I don't understand that concept. In the winter of my legislative years, I've, I've never seen such partisan attacks on ideas, especially one uh, that provides for health care for Americans. It seems to me that it's our moral responsibility, but our legal responsibility to enforce the law. Is that? to enforce the law, and that's what you two intend to do. However, my speaker has made it clear that this particular Congress should not be judged by our performance in enacting law, but rather we should concern ourselves with the number of laws that have been repealed. So while I do believe in the good intent of my Republican friends, I want you to answer the question, how can this committee help you to effectively do your job, which you, by law, have to do 
if they tell you at this hearing that their position is not to help you but to defend, to defund the resources that you need in order to do the job. What is your answer? Is there inconsistency in any question and ask how you're performing? If what they're going to produce is taking the money away, will, will this committee in good faith be improving the law or trying to make certain that the law does not work? Uh, I would just say that um, the President's uh, 2014 budget requests $1.5 billion for uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Act, and this committee certainly could help us, and we'd welcome its support uh, That's very with nice, respect to that request. Well, if indeed this ridiculous plan that is born dead, except for political purposes, was to succeed, then there would be no need for your appearance before this committee. Isn't that correct? If they repeal the funding of it, oh, you right. have no program. <laughs> That's true. And that is the public stated goal of the majority of the Republicans here, to not give you the resources. So you coming here is just establishing a blueprint of a destructive plan that not only concerns health care, but concerns the integrity of the United States' ability to keep government running. And the first step that we're supposed to do this is to defend the health care for the citizens that we have pledged to protect. And so I hope that soon, Mr. Chairman, we'll have the Treasury here and other agencies that have obligations to see how I can be better understood how the majority intends to deplete the funding for health care and to stop the government from producing and unfortunately not to have any plan to replace it. So if this is the beginning shot of the war, I'm succeed that once we hear from the religious community, the health providers, the business community, that we will succeed. And I do hope uh, that some of my Republican friends will see that passing and improving laws is a heck of a lot better than destroying and repealing laws and let me thank you for at least your attempt to show that you're going to do the best you can, and this Congress is going to do the best it can under President Obama to provide health care for all American citizens. Thank you thank for you. your service. Mr. Brady. You know, my, my families are worried that if Obamacare is not ready for businesses, is it ready for their family, for their children, for their loved ones? You know, there's a lot of lives at stake in health care. You have to be able to depend upon it. And I think they see, you know, Warren Buffett gets a break from the White House on the employer mandate, but a single mom of mine working in Texas doesn't. On January 1st, they're forced to buy government-approved health care or pay a tax, and they're worried about it. And they haven't seen, I have to tell you, regrettably, that $2,500 uh, reduction in health care costs President promised my constituents, it's nowhere to be found. Mr. Cohen, we've heard from the head of Medicare and Medicaid Services just a few weeks ago the testing's nearly done with the data hub. It's almost ready to go. So I wanted to ask about that. Uh, has, uh, have you successfully sent a pilot application to the Social Security Administration, and have they successfully verified it back to you? Um, we had so, uh, we have begun testing with Social Security uh, Administration uh, in May. Um, the testing is continuing and it will be completed uh, this month. But you're saying you you haven't yet successfully sent a pilot. You know, I'm going to have to get back to you on the details of exactly okay. what has happened. How about with tests, Department of Homeland Security? All, have you all, sent an application there and? They've checked prisoner status and my answer, lawful presence. My answer is the same for all those agencies. We are engaged in testing now. Uh, it it's began um, uh, a few months ago. It, it's continuing, um, and it will be completed this month. So you're, I'm just – it's a really simple question. Have you sent a pilot I, trial application out, received it back, successfully and accurately. I, I understand your question, and I, I just, I don't want to get into deep water on the technical aspect that Well, I'm that's not, not very technical. In. It's um, just like a person the, comes to the exchanges, they put in their application, pretty easy, 
and you've said, we've, we've got it checked out, it's already working. And, I, and I'm sure we can get that answer for you to, to your specific question. Isn't that your key job? I mean, aren't you in charge of having this data hub and the exchanges ready to go? Uh, I am one of the people who is working on implementation of the Affordable Care Act along with a number of people at, at sure. CMS. Yeah. And hey. I just don't want to give you an answer that isn't correct. No, I appreciate that. So have you I'm sent si an application, a trial application to the states that have exchanges up? Because that's, that's really basic process. We're on the eve of the exchanges. So you've sent it to the states. We to are testing. We are, uh, the, my answer is the same. We have begun testing with the states. That testing is ongoing uh, and it's going to be completed this month. And the same is true with the uh, uh, health issuers that are going to be participating in this as is well. Is it safe to say at this point a pilot application has not been sent successfully throughout the data hub system and we turned accurately. I, I just want to be careful to give you accurate information, so I'd rather make sure that I'm giving you the right answer yeah. and, and, and supply that. Was so it you. more yes or more no? I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I just can't say any more than I have. It's just not very reassuring for families uh, on the eve of this that. Uh, I'm, not saying, those there, I'm not saying there isn't an answer, I'm just saying I, I will get it for you. There doesn't appear to be an answer. I think our constituents are hoping for. Ms. Werfel, let me ask you this. You, this data hub, you know, is, is a hacker's dream, but I don't know who I most fear, someone from the outside hacking the information or the way our government handles it. Uh, you've assured us that the IRS, despite the significant ab abuses of power we're already investigating, that the IRS has never shared private taxpayer information with other federal agencies, but I'm looking at an email from 2008 where Lois Lerner did exactly that. She shared a private taxpayer information with the Federal Election Commission. So how should we, one, how is she still on the payroll? Two, why did you tell us this didn't happen? And three, why should we trust the IRS to protect our taxpayer information under Obamacare? So let me, uh, let me respond to each of those. First, let me clarify. Um, I never assured that, um, that there aren't incidences that occur. We share information roughly with uh, 300 different federal and state agencies as a matter of routine business. And we have procedures and safeguards in place to protect that information. But no procedure or safeguard is perfect. And there are, have been historically incidences where unauthorized information has, uh, information has Sir, been. Sir, that's not what you told us in your last appearance before the committee. My time has expired, but I hope we can, I can continue I, if, this if you line want, of question. I can answer that question um, If you want to respond in writing for the record, we'll make sure that's that. part yes. of it. Um, Mr. McDermott is recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome, gentlemen. As uh, Mr. Rankle has said, you're in war. This is not a hearing. This is a battle. Uh, and it is a typical political battle where one side is throwing up dust and trying to confuse everybody all over the country about what's happening. Uh, this hearing is really the culmination of months of a careful buildup. The majority has been crafting a scandal narrative to support their truly relentless agenda to appeal the Affordable Care Act. For two months, we've heard nonstop complaints against the IRS being corrupt and incompetent, despite that the only politically motivated act was the Republicans' request that the IG focus only on the treatment of conservative groups. They did not ask for a full study. They only asked for how did it affect their friends in the Tea Party. So today we're going to discuss whether or not the IRS and CMS are capable and competent enough to see the law through. And my colleagues already have thrown dust and mud at the wall to see if it sticks. None of it does. Uh, and what we're going to do tomorrow is the 40th fig leaf vote. Senator Cruz from Texas called these fig leaf votes to give people some cover when they go home so that people won't see they're absolutely naked. 
The truth about this Congress is that for 18 years, this committee has been functioning. 16 of those years were under the Republicans. We have never taken a vote in this committee under Republicans on comprehensive reform. For all their talk, nothing has ever been tabled in this committee. Now, we tabled a bill here and we passed it out under Speaker Pelosi. And they've been trying desperately for five years now to destroy it. And the question before us is whether the IRS is ready and able to collect your name, your family size, and income data to be used in a federal exchange hub. Not health status. They won't have anything about anybody's ingrown toenails in this report. There's no prescription drug history that the IRS is going to have or the health care provider's name just the data they collect from their average database of putting on the tax system in this country. Name, how much you make, how many people in your family. As far as CMS goes, they're ready. Exchanges, Medicare expansions will be ready to go. My state of Washington, we're going to have 80 percent registered by the 1st of March. We're already ready to go. And it's been, we've done an aggressive awareness campaign all along the West Coast, California, Oregon, and Washington. You watch. The rest of this, this dais is going to be looking and say, why can't we have that in wherever they're from? My constituents are already seeing an average of $500 a family in insurer rebates from parts of the ACA that are already working to hold insurers accountable for how they spend the premium dollar they take in. This is not an investigation in pursuit of better government. It is a desperate 11th hour attempt to stop a law that will help Americans. Hard for me to believe that people who have made no proposals are saying to their people back home, don't you dare sign up to this, this Obamacare. It's going to be awful for you. You're going to wind up I don't know how you run for office telling people that you don't want to. And the proposal that's on the table here today is straight out of the Republican Party. Mitt Romney created it in Massachusetts, and at least one member on this dais campaigned na nationally on this issue, saying that they're now against Romney Care, as it's put nationwide. So I would like to hear what happens to the 50-year-old, the person who's got a 50-year, $50,000 a year income, when they go to the exchange? What will happen to them? They'll explain the process for people. You just have a few seconds remaining, so. <laughs> well, <laughs> a, <laughs> I think a person with a $50,000 year uh, dollar income is going to, that's going to be too too much income to be eligible for subsidies, so they can buy insurance through the marketplace, they can buy insurance through the existing uh, health care uh, uh, marketplace outside the exchange. They'll have all the choices that are available to them. Uh, this is a private market solution to a pressing social problem. All right, thank you. Mr. Ryan. I enjoy following Mr. McDermott. Um, I guess the new line here is that the majority is peddling a scandal narrative that they're throwing something at the wall to see if it sticks. We had a gentleman from the National Organization of Marriage come here and testify how the IRS leaked their sensitive taxpayer information to their political opponents. We had a lady from a pro-life group in Iowa who told us how the IRS said, if you surrender your First Amendment rights to speak your views, then maybe we'll approve your application. That is not a phony scandal. That is a real scandal. No matter what our colleagues try to say to whisk this issue away, the government was intimidating people and targeting them based upon their political views. That's not phony. That's real. Now here, I want to actually ask you a question instead of giving a speech for five minutes and then asking you a question you know, with 10 seconds to go. Um, Mr. Cohen, is an adult child, meaning somebody under the age of 26, who has a parent with affordable employer-sponsored insurance eligible re to receive a tax credit in the exchange? No. Okay, so let's walk through a scenario here. Take a young woman 
uh, 25 years old, living in Milwaukee. And her mom and dad live in Chicago. And they have employer-sponsored health insurance. She goes to the exchange because her job in Milwaukee doesn't offer her health insurance. Right. And she gets the three-page application for single people without employer coverage. The application says specifically, quote, single adults who aren't offered health coverage from their employer. There are no further questions about employer coverage. So she signs up. She gets a subsidy. It could be thousands of dollars of subsidy that she's not eligible for because her parents. Now, you know, I may, I may be wrong then. You, you, I may be incorrect in my previous uh, My understanding of the law is that she is not eligible for a okay. subsidy okay. if her parents' insurance covers this. But since you delayed the employer mandate, your data hub has no way of reconciling that record, so she's going to get a subsidy she's not entitled to or eligible for. Uh, take a husband and wife um, living in Madison. The husband has been the person with the insurance for the family, but he's losing it because the, the company's not doing it anymore. He got his hours knocked down to 30 or something like that. The wife works at a job, and her employer does offer credible insurance, but she didn't take it because she never has before, and it's just another year, and she's not doing it. He goes and signs up for the exchange. He gets the subsidy. He gets Obamacare. But they're not eligible for the subsidy. But you have no way of verifying that. So what are you going to do? Are you going to make this person pay it back, Mr. Werfel? Because if I'm not mistaken, the law requires you to do so. And if we're not going to reconcile this record until maybe 2016, as you just said, so is that going to be two years of subsidies going to people that they're not eligible for? They didn't get it fraudulently. They just got it through confusion. Then. Does the law not require you to put a huge tax on their tax bill at the end of the day when you finally reconcile this, these, this data? And so then they'll get thousands of dollars of taxes clawing back the subsidy that they were not eligible for. Is that not what you will have to do? A couple of responses. First, the employer report that is going to be very helpful in validating the state of coverage you're right, we're not going to get it in filing season 2015, but there are other ways that we can work with the employer community to get that information. You're going to have validated. that up and running when these people start filling this out next year? We are working very closely, and I think HHS and the exchanges and, and IRS were working together with the business community to figure out alternative solutions. Okay, it's so a partnership with the business community. So this fall when the 25-year-old Milwaukeean signs up because she doesn't get health insurance at her job, but she's ineligible legally for the subsidy. When she actually applies for the subsidy because she doesn't know any better, because the application doesn't say any better, if, if she's, you're going to catch that? If she's in the right income, if she's uh, between 100 and 400 percent of the poverty level, it's my she, understanding. Most 25-year-olds are. It's my understanding that the exchange will reach out to employer and employers at that time. It won't be the official report that we'll be getting in filing season 2016. Okay. But again, it's not, it's, it's not Let's an say her set. parents live in Texas. And she's living in Milwaukee. This exchange is going to see all of this. It's going to figure all this out. You've delayed the employer mandate. And you're going to reconcile this record. You're going to make sure that she doesn't get a subsidy she's not entitled to? I'm saying that we're working on solutions. I IRS is working on solutions at the back end. The exchanges okay. are working on solutions. Let me get it this way. Yep. Let's say you don't catch it. Do you not have to hit her with a tax liability to claw back that subsidy that she didn't get? Let's say, say you don't catch it. And she gets the subsidy she's not supposed to get. You have to hit her with a tax to claw it back at the end of the day, correct? If, well, if we, if we find that there's a problem, that she, she got a credit that she shouldn't have gotten, if yeah. we do that, and we might be able to do that by working with the employer community, I'm just saying, assume we will, but there'll be a cap. If, depending on her income level, and I can walk through that with you, they, there's protection for those individuals in those cases where we would cap the amount that we would claw back. But, but, but you know, I, I would just say, I don't, I don't know why anyone who could get free insurance free to them insurance through their parents' policy would choose instead to go on the marketplace and pay for insurance, even if they get a subsidy. I guess we'll just have to hope, won't we? No, All it's right. not a question of hope. It's Thank a you. question of logic. All right. Mr. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if, if, has the majority devised a way that we'll be able to vote on this during the August break? If the gentleman would like us to, I'm sorry. Well, I, I mean, we could do perhaps proxy voting or Internet voting or early voting in anticipation of September. I think well, that the game plan here is to get to the 40th and the 100th time before implementation. I think Mr. Roskinkowski was the last chairman that allowed proxy voting. You, you seem to work better, by the way, than what we're experiencing here. I must tell you that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, 
to follow up to Mr. Rangel's uh, questions about what we're witnessing in New York and on in some of the other states, w would you care to expound, and I'll give you some time to talk about the trend line that you're witnessing? Yes, thank you. Um, w uh, HHS put out a report uh, uh, recently that captured the uh, 10 states in the District of Columbia, and since then we've seen Maryland, that have made public the rates. And that's a matter of state law and procedure that they make those rates public when they're, when they're uh, filed. Um, it, on average, they were 18 percent below what the Congressional Budget Office estimated premiums would be in the marketplace beginning in 2014. Um, in, um, in, in all cases, they were, uh, you know, what our analysis shows are affordable particularly when you then take into consideration the subsidies that people will be eligible for that will help pay for a portion of those premiums. Um, so we are, what we are seeing is in states where there is a relatively competitive market uh, with a number of carriers that are offering coverage in the market, uh, the marketplaces are offering uh, new opportunity, new transparency, new competition that is having a very positive effect on rates. In addition, we have seen overall health insurance costs and premiums are going up at a much lower rate today than they have been in decades. That certainly has been the case in Massachusetts, despite some of the acrimony that has developed in, in terms of the overall argument. There's been a stability that has settled in. And you'll read stories from time to time indicating that this has changed or that's changed. But by and large, the satisfaction rate in the state of Massachusetts based upon Governor Romney's plan, working incidentally with the Democratic legislature that came to the, the conclusion that you could, on a state-by-state -state experiment, stabilize health care costs. And I can't emphasize enough that uh, when you have almost three quarters of the people in the state who regularly suggest that they're satisfied with the plan. I think you've got a good model there to build upon. I agree. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Nunes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a little concerned at Mr. Warfield's uh, inability uh, to answer Mr. Ryan's question. I want to yield to Mr. Ryan to follow up on his uh, question that Mr. Warfield could try to be brief. Um, I don't think you understand the law you're in charge of executing and enforcing. The clawback, as you describe, where you limit how much a person pays back, that's only a person who is eligible for a subsidy if their income changes in the year in which the subsidy takes place. But if a person, this is your law, if a person gets a subsidy they're not eligible for, which clearly will be the case if your major enforcement tool, the employer mandate, is not in place, the law requires you claw, claw back 100% of that subsidy through which they were not entitled to. Yeah, so, I apologize. I mean, the, the hypothetical that you gave had a lot of moving pieces, but you're correct. Okay, we, somebody we gets a subsidy put, they're I not think, eligible for. Well, one question I have is we've discovered that this individual got an inappropriate subsidy. So we've made some connection with their employer to learn that information. Which will be 2015 at the earliest. We could learn it in 2015. We'll get the official employer report in 2016. Either way, we're going to make the efforts All right, so to two validate years. the fact of coverage for each individual that's receiving a subsidy. So somebody will get two years of a subsidy that they signed up for unknowingly that they got, which the law does not make them eligible for. You will have to tax that back in two years' time to all of it. Well, that is the law, correct? We're going to help the individual um, at the front end where they're filling out their taxes and then we're navigating through the exchange to understand whether they have an employer provided plan. I, I think you've already answered the question. If you're not, if you don't have an employer mandate and you don't have the tool in the data hub, which you claim you need to have to verify this, you're going to have a lot of people getting subsidies they're not supposed to get. And then you're going to hit them with a big tax bill in about two years to claw it back because the law requires you to do that. Mr. I yield back to Mr. Nunes. Free, free money. Uh, Mr. Cohen. Uh, do you foresee any additional Obamacare provisions that may not be ready for implementation? No. Uh, do you see uh, any more grants, uh, any, uh, grant any more waivers to employers or companies that come and petition for a, another additional time or a waiver? No. None? No. You're not going to give any waivers to any companies, any unions? Well, I 
if but what you mean by waiver is telling someone that they are not required to follow the law that I'm charged with implementing, the answer is no. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Warfell, will the IRS need to access Americans' health care records in order to enforce the Obamacare tax? No. What records will they have to go after there's to two enforce key, the Obamacare tax? There's two tax? key things. In order to comply with the law, we are providing uh, taxpayer information through the hub to the exchanges. That is income, filing status, uh, household size. Um, and the other factor that we need to know is we need to know fact of coverage. So we'll get uh, information about the policy itself, like the policy number and the insurer. Other than that, there's no other information. We do do a computation for what the premium tax credit or the advanced premium tax credit is. We get an information where we are blind to what the individual is. Uh, we get it through the exchange information like the, um, you know, the, the plan that they've chosen, the cost, okay. and some of the other. Okay, so that information that you're going to have. Yeah. How many other government agencies at this time will you be sharing that information with? Um, tax records. I don't know. I, I will answer the question this way. We currently share taxpayer information with roughly 300 federal and state agencies under existing laws and regulations without the ACA. The ACA will add additional entities that will receive this information, in particular the exchanges, both the state and the federally run exchanges. 300 different? No, no. Right now, the baseline is 300 different federal and state agencies under existing law and regulations before the ACA ever came about receive taxpayer information from IRS, and as I mentioned, there's a lot of safeguards in place to protect that information. Now, that a number of entities will be expanded. I don't have the exact number at my fingertips, but it's expanded because the information is flowing through to both the federal exchange and the state-based exchanges. How many IRS, new IRS agents have been hired to date to implement Obamacare? Uh, I can get you that information. I don't have it at my fingertips. Hundreds, thousands? Um, if you, you know, if you give me a moment, I will, I will get that information and I can get to, get it to you before the end of the year. Okay, event. and can you get not only how many have been hired to date, but also how many you plan to hire to I, enforce I can the work Obamacare? On, yeah, yeah, I mean, we will have estimates on that for the 2014 budget. I will say right now we're in a hiring freeze due to sequester and other budget cuts, so there's been a lot of challenge there, but the 2014 thank, budget. Thank God for that. I yield back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Becerra, and then we'll go two to one after that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. Let me uh, assure you of something. Um, at some point, we will start to ask you questions more and more bipartisanly on how to implement this. But for now, it, it, you're witnessing and experiencing part of a strategy to undermine the ability for the health security law to actually take effect. And uh, last, last week in the article that Mr. Levin introduced into the record by Mr. Norm Ornstein with the American Enterprise Institute, which is a conservative think tank, uh, in that article titled, The Unpre Unprecedented and Contemptible Attempts to Sabotage Obamacare, uh, Mr. Ornstein, and let me just quote a couple of passages so we know what we're getting into. This was last week's article. What is going on now to sabotage Obamacare is not treasonous just sharply beneath any reasonable standards of elected officials with the fiduciary responsi responsibility of governing. He goes on to say, to do everything possible to undercut and destroy its implementation of the health care law, which in this case means finding ways to deny coverage to many who lack any health insurance, to keep millions who might be able to get better and cheaper coverage in the dark about their new options, to create disruption for the health providers who are trying to implement the law, to threaten the even greater disruption via government shutdown in order to blackmail the president into abandoning the law, and to hope to benefit politically from all the resulting turmoil is simply unacceptable, even contemptible. And that was written last week. If people didn't believe Mr. Ornstein in what he was writing, then recently it was just uh, leaked out that uh, this week the Republic, our, our Rep Republican colleagues had a meeting where a strategy was introduced by the speaker, where the strategy was a series of targeted strikes that will fracture the President's Obamacare coalition and topple this law. And so they go through the strategy of how to do this, and one of those is this hearing and this proposal, legislative proposal that's before us. And I, I think at some point we'll get to the heart, nuts and bolts of administering the law, 
because it is important. I had a gentleman write to me from my district back in 2009 when we were trying to pass this health security law. He wrote to me. His name was Eric. I won't give you his last name. I am a self-employed architect and pay monthly for a very expensive bottom line high deductible policy. My wife and I are covered, but our son had a stroke when he was eight years old. He is not insurable. Our coverage costs $750 per month. This is very expensive, beyond what we can afford, and they're, and they're only as an emergency coverage. If we use the insurance, it immediately jumps in price. The last time, it was a $250 per month increase in cost. If we incur another increase, we will have to drop the policy. Mr. Cohen, the law passed. Eric and his wife are now under the new law. Is Eric's son now able to get insurance coverage? That's right. Eric, the, the law t today prohibits uh, insurance companies from denying Eric's son coverage because of his previous stroke. So that little boy who could not get coverage before the health security law today has coverage the way every other child with that same kind of pre-existing condition would be able to get coverage. So let me correct. ask you about another gentleman from my district, Benjamin. He says, our insurance company retroactively canceled my wife's coverage after they had approved her to get an MRI. She was stuck with a bill that has taken three years to pay off. They scoured her record to find any mistake they could call her on, rather than foot a bill for a procedure that they had approved for her to undergo. I do not consider this insurance. It is more akin to gambling. Today, because of the rescissions provisions that we put into the law, is the insurance company able to uh, deny Benjamin and his wife payment for the MRI that the insurance company had approved? They can't. That's a practice that some insurance companies engaged in called post-claims underwriting. When someone came in with a claim, they would go back to see if they could find a, ba uh, a reason to uh, uh, take the policy away just because the person got sick and made a claim. They can't do that anymore. And we've also heard that this health security law that passed was a job killer. I remember that was one of the big arguments against doing this law. My understanding is, you're, you may not be aware of this, but that close to a million jobs have been created in the healthcare industry since April 2010 when we passed the law. Rather than kill jobs, it has helped create more jobs because people are gearing up in the healthcare industry to help some 30, 30 million new Americans actually have health insurance like Eric and Benjamin will have for their, their families. I hope at some point we'll be able to actually get to the nuts and bolts of how we make this law work better because there clearly are kinks. No one denies that there are flaws in the law. The implementation has to go much better than the, the policy and the written word in the law. But at some point, the, the fever will break in Washington. We will get back to work here the way Americans expect us to, and we will make this law work for everyone. I, thank you for being here. And you I, look, I look forward to that, Congressman. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Tiberi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me assure my colleagues on the other side that the reason why we have concerns is we don't believe there are kinks, that there are major problems. And let me read you a letter from a constituent who I've never met before, or a part of a letter. I'm a student employee at Miami University in Oxford, working this summer in a university research lab. Last week, this was dated earlier this week, last week I received a notice from the university staff informing me that due to recently changed policy, I no longer would be able to work full time, and I'd have to stop working after reaching 28 hour limit per week. Of course, I was startled and upset, and it was not long before I knew the culprit behind this change in policy was the Affordable Care Act. That's one of many letters, phone calls, meetings that I've had, not kinks, real life problems with the Affordable Care Act. The chairman mentioned Mr. Cohen at the beginning uh, that the president stated that the average family would see a $2,500 reduction. I remember that because I, I heard a lot about that in my district in central Ohio after he mentioned that. Have you seen the rate filings for the, for the uh, plans being offered in the state of Ohio, Mr. Cohen? I haven't. You haven't yet? I haven't either. Uh, the people of my state haven't. However, our insurance department is warning that individuals in our state could face an 88 percent premium increase from current plans in our state. Would that be an, a $2,500 reduction? It wouldn't, but most of those projections have really proven to be completely erroneous. So I don't know what the, uh, what they're looking at there. Uh, I don't, er erroneous know. based on what? 
erroneous on whether you're making a real fair comparison between the type of coverage that uh, people will have, uh, you know, beginning in 2014 and, and whatever coverage that they had today. So what the insurance department has said is apples to apples. Basically, if you have a plan today offered by Blue Cross Blue Shield that is a standard plan, uh, you will, in the exchange, see a standard plan that will go up about 88 percent. Wouldn't that be a way to well, I, and I haven't, I haven't seen those rates, so I can't comment on that prediction. Okay. Well, I would hope that you would come back after October 1st when that information is public. So constituents who ask us why these plans are going up, then we can ask you. On CMS's Marketplace Training slideshow uh, from this month entitled Understanding the Health Insurance Marketplace, uh, specifically notes that there are 10 population centers around the country, including Ohio. There are three, including Columbus, where I am from. Uh, that you will have special enrollment assisters contracted to help uninsured young and healthy people. That's your quote or their quote. Um, can you tell me what, tell me about what the special enrollment and sister, assisters will do and how they'll be contracted and who will pay for them? Um, we have put out for bid a contract for people to help with enrollment. Um, the, the, what you're referring to is the fact that we want to focus our efforts on areas where there are large numbers of uninsured, uh, and um, those folks will be available to uh, provide assistance to how, people. How are they different than navigators? The, the navigator program is a grant program, and we've solicited grants from community-based organizations uh, that will be doing, uh, also helping people assist uh, in getting enrolled. This is a federal contract. So they'll be doing the same job, but their titles are different? They'll, they'll differently. be doing essentially the same work, but one is a grant program through, through you know, locally-based communities. The other is a, con a federal contract. So also on the website, and, and clear, try to clear up this confusion for me, I found references to navigators, non-navigator assistance personnel, in-person assister, special enrollment assister, consumer assistance programs, certified application counselor. They have different roles? Um, the, the roles are similar. Some of those, uh, the navigators, for example, will be doing, I think, more uh, outreach and education as well as actually helping people get enrolled. But the enrollment assisters, uh, their job will really be to help people go through the process of filling out an application. Right. And the funding is different. So as I said, the grant program versus a contract. I, I, know, I know the folks on the other side of the aisle believe that we have just a contempt for this, but there's a ton of confusion that comes from this website, from our constituents who don't understand, who aren't, uh, I don't understand, who, who don't understand the difference between those different types of programs, how they're funded, are they agents, are they not agents, how familiar are they with health care uh, law, health care uh, services, and so I would hope that, and I, I'm going to send you a letter to get some other clarifications on just from your website uh, confusion that's already come to, to our office. Yeah, my, my assumption is that people aren't going to care very much what name the, you know, or what funding source they're going to be looking for help to get health insurance coverage, and they will take that help, and they'll be very happy for it. All right, thank you. Mr. Reichert. Well, I want to just uh, sort of repeat what my uh, colleague here, Mr. Tiberi, said. There is a lot of confusion, and, and, and I think that this hearing is, is a, a forum where we can get some of those answers, hopefully. And so we appreciate your attendance here. And uh, we do have some legitimate questions. And, and is just sitting here and listening to some of the testimony and some of the exchanges, it's obvious to me that even you're confused about what the law says or doesn't say. Uh, what you've accomplished or haven't accomplished or may accomplish or what some of your deadlines are, uh, your answers aren't clear. And I think everybody in the audience and people on the panel and people at home watching uh, can see that. Uh, so, Mr. Wolfor, I want to start out with um, have just some questions that are yes or no questions. Have you been able to implement Section 9003, uh, which increases taxes by limiting health savings account expenditures? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that question. Uh, I think you have been. Have, have you been able to implement Section 9004, increasing taxes on distributions from 
uh, HAS and MASAs not used for qualified medical expenses? Again, I'll have to get back to you on the answer to that. And question. I think that's a yes. Have you been able to implement Section 9005, increasing taxes by limiting health flexible spending arrangements under uh, cafeteria plans? Again, I will get you that information. That, I think that's a yes. Have you implemented Section 9007, putting additional requirements on charitable hospitals? Again, I will get you the answer and that answer. That's question. a yes. Have you Im implemented Section 9008, increasing taxes on branded prescription pharmaceutical manufacturers and importers? I believe we have implemented that, yes. Yes. Have you implemented Section 9009, which increases the medical device tax? Yes. Yes. Are you on track to implement Section 9010, which imposes a tax on health insurance providers? Uh, I will get back to you on that question. That's a yes. Have we're you generally on track with all of our major deliverables. <laughs> have you implemented Section 9013, raising taxes on those who have to take an itemized deduction on medical expenses? I, again, I believe we're on track with all of Probably a yes. So you, you, you are on track with all of these. Some of these you couldn't answer, but I have information that these are all yeses, that you've completed implementing these tax laws. Um, I'm disappointed that the supposed benefits of this law haven't been seen by my constituents. And I think that's a frustrating part, not only frustrating, but confusing. I'm not sure if they'll ever be seen by my constituents. And so I find it sort of uh, odd, too, that the employees at the IRS, including yourself, because you just made this statement, you feel like you have good health insurance. You'd like to keep that health insurance. So would the IRS employees. So would a lot of the other Americans across this country. But one of the health benefits, one of the benefits in this health law was supposedly that we could keep our health care plan if we liked it, uh, or we could keep our doctor uh, if we liked our doctor. But according to the President, and I'll paraphrase a quote that we heard him say at a conference he attended and spoke, was that, you know, there seems to be some language snuck into the, into the health care law that runs contrary to that premise runs contrary to the premise of you can keep your doctor if you like your doctor, and it runs contrary to the premise that you can keep your health care plan if you, if, you, if you like it. But IRS agents uh, supposedly now have filed a waiver because they can't keep their health care plan if they like it. They have to ask for a waiver. Well, you know, I know of a lot of Americans that would have, want to ask for a waiver. So uh, it's deeply disappointing that the only part of this bill that you've been able to implement are the provisions that have cost Americans uh, and will cost Americans in their pocketbook. Mr. Cohen, uh, I'm really uh, confused by your testimony about uh, testing of Data Hub. Uh, you, you'll, you'll get back to us on an answer? Is that, is that what I heard you say? You're, you're, you're testing, right? We, yes, we what's are the, testing. What's the testing? I want to know what the testing is. How, the the what? testing is all aspects of the system that are going to be needed to uh, so what you, what be operational what on done? October 1st. What have you done? Are being tested. What have you done? What when you mean when you say testing? What do you mean? What have you done? What's the test? So I'm a lay person. I'm not an IT person. So I'm going to give you the lay person's answer. They 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 test the systems to make sure they're functioning as they're meant to. They put in different. They run different scenarios to to see whether and you think you're on track. We absolutely are. Well, in fact, less than two weeks ago, insurers warned that both they and your department, quote, face significant operational and logistical challenges in the first two years at a minimum, which are dependent in large part on a variety of technical interfaces, data exchanges, and program infrastructure. I think you're in trouble. I don't think you're going to meet your deadline, and I yield back. All right. Mr. Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has come as quite a surprise this morning to learn that the focus and purpose of this hearing is to determine whether the Affordable Health Care Act is on track, because the people that are conducting the hearing uh, when it comes to health care have been very zealous on the derailment program uh, for health care. Uh, they have offered no constructive suggestions. Uh, it's never how can we make health care work better for the American people. It's always how can we derail it? Uh, I'm surprised, in fact, that they even have time to have a hearing between the repeal votes, uh, because we've had so many of them. Two and a half years ago, in this very room, we had our first hearing at the beginning of the last Congress on the repeal of Obamacare. And the House proceeded to repeal it, vote number one. 
The next day, it passed a two-page bill that contained 12 platitudes about health care. And that's the last time we've heard about those platitudes in terms of any legislative action, except for one bill last year that provided tax breaks for Tylenol. The, uh, the alternatives being offered to the American people to Obamacare is really nothing care when it comes to legislative action in this committee and on the floor of the House. Now, there are many problems with the Affordable Health Care Act. I wish your efforts to try to see it effectively implemented weren't day after day being undermined and underfunded and interfered with. But tell us, if you would, Mr. Cohen, on October 1st, because I've never thought that their attacks were about denying the IRS power or denying you power. They're about denying rights to the American people that they are now entitled to under the Affordable Health Care Act. On October 1st, if you're among the millions of uninsured people in Texas that don't have any way to get insurance right now, what rights do you have then uh, as an American citizen under this act? Uh, you'll be able to uh, submit an application either online or in person or over the phone or on paper. Uh, you'll be able to determine whether you're eligible for a Medicaid or CHIP on the one hand or a subsidy uh, uh, in the form of an advanced payment of a tax credit on the other. You'll be able to shop and choose a private health insurance plan that you want to enroll in. Uh, and uh, beginning in January, uh, payments will, you'll have to make a premium payment, um, but in addition, uh, uh, the, that amount of that advance premium tax credit will go directly to the insurance company and help pay for that coverage. And if, if you're working at a lower wage job, you're entitled to a premium tax credit to assist you in getting health insurance that you haven't been able to get up till now. That's right. I had a woman uh, a while back at a Real Aid to Life gathering come up to me in tears because her sister had breast cancer. And when she went to get treatment, she learned she only had $25,000 of treatment to get radiation and chemotherapy to treat that condition. And they wouldn't let her begin the treatment because it was gonna cost so much more than that. Right. What happens to a woman like that who was left as a victim to the fine print put in there by her insurance company that she knew nothing about uh, as a typical insurance purchaser, what happens to her under the Affordable Care Act that they want to derail? So even th those provisions are in effect even today and have been since September of 2010. Lifetime limits are no longer permitted, so you can't put a cap on the amount of money that an insurance policy will pay over the course of the person's lifetime. And annual limits have been phased out and now, uh, beginning in 2014, will also be completely eliminated. So uh, an insurance company can't say we'll only pay a certain amount of money in a year for your claims. And as so far as rights that exist right now under this uh, Affordable Health Care Act, the same Affordable Health Care Act uh, that the latest thing in the last few days has been whether they're willing to shut down the entire government, threaten the full faith and credit of the United States, just because they're so zealous about derailing the Affordable Care Act and denying rights to Americans, right now, if you're a senior, uh, do you get any rights that if we repeal the Affordable Health Care Act, you would be denied uh, it, uh, that you get under the Affordable Health Care Act already? Um, there are a number of rights under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, for example, preventive services are provided uh, uh, free of any uh, copay or any uh, deductible. Um, that's a, just an example. So people can actually get the kind of preventive care that they need to keep themselves healthy. And prescription drugs, are there any benefits that if we repealed the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, seniors would be denied that they have today? The donut, so-called donut hole was closed by the Affordable Care Act. So uh, uh, m millions of seniors have saved uh, uh, money as a result. And of the solvency of Medicare would be reduced also by that, that almost That answer will have to be Thank the you. end of it. Thank you. Dr. Bustani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I'm glad to see that my colleague from Texas recognizes that there are many, many problems with this, this health care law. Uh, I'm certainly aware of it with 30 years of uh, clinical experience in medicine, certainly aware of the problems attendant with this law. Mr. Werfel, uh, Mr. Ryan pointed out a number of problems that are going to occur 
because of the delay in, in the employer mandate or the re employer re uh, reporting requirements and um, you know the propensity for overpayment of subsidies, possible fraud, abuse, and so forth. And yet, Treasury had three years to come up with the regulations uh, on how this would work on these, on these reporting requirements. And obviously, the department has failed to date to come up with an adequate approach to this, hence the delay. Um, so is there a problem with the statute? I know you, you're in charge of implementing. You, the burden is on your shoulders to implement this. But I, I know you've had some discussion with Treasury on this. Is there a problem with this statute? I don't think there's a, I'm not aware of a particular problem with the statute. Um, we are working with the uh, insurer and employer community to understand how best to implement the legislation through regulation and other reporting requirements. But three years, there's been, it's been three years, some very smart lawyers working on this, and you referenced, uh, I believe you said earlier, alternative methods to validate. I mean, can you give us any indication of what those alternative methods will be, or is there any hope that you can implement this? Well, there's a communication that we can set up with employ. I think you're, there's a lot of issues here, but the one that I think you're focusing on is whether we can determine whether an employer-provided plan would block an individual from getting a premium tax credit. That's one issue, and, and I think the, the transition relief period or the delay does create additional challenge for the IRS in doing that, but it's not something that we can't but three years, mitigate. We three can work years with is a long time. When did those discussions begin? Uh, I mean, I know you're, you're, you're relatively new in the position. Were you brought into these discussions from day one? Uh, not from day one. Uh, the first I learned about it was in late June uh, the, uh, that this uh, issue was under consideration, but my staff had been consulted before then because they were constantly consulting IRS staff to understand what are the administrative impacts. And in this case, we looked at the administrative impacts and we determined that we can work with the employer community to get other sources of information from them to do the job of determining whether there was a sufficient employer did, offer. Did the IRS recommend the delay? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Were other agencies or departments involved in, um, in those discussions? or? Um, Did they recommend the delay? I think it's my understanding that HHS and Treasury uh, discussed the issue. I'm not sure where the, the, who in the government recommended the delay. I do understand that the employer community came in and we received comments that they preferred we take more time, delay the provision, and work through I think the employer issues. community would like to see that employer mandate go away. But uh, when, when were you informed of the delay? I, I think it was announced in a blog post yeah. on July 2nd. Were you... Uh, Notified earlier? It was late June. I think it was around June 21st that I learned of it. Okay. Who, who told you? Um, I, my recollection is I was in a meeting with the Treasury Department on a bunch of issues, and this was on the agenda, and it came up, and I understood that this decision was in the works and was being made. Okay. Well, obviously, we need to do more oversight, and I take issue with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle who think this is all a charade and a joke. We're trying to do oversight, and we're trying to understand what the problems are, and um, Obviously, there are plenty of problems, and this is just one of them. Uh, one other question on a different subject. Uh, over a year ago, I asked uh, then-acting Commissioner Steve Miller to provide all documents with regard to the application of premium sub the decision about premium subsidies and whether or not they would apply to federally created exchanges. We haven't gotten those documents yet. I would like you to commit to me to get those documents to us surrounding that IRS decision because it seems to run counter to the statute. Could you get that to us before September? I was not aware of that document request. I commit to you that I will look into the issue and get back to you as soon as possible with the time I mean, frame. it's been a year, so, I mean, hopefully. Yeah, I just have to look into it. I know staff have done work. I hope staff have done work on that. I would like that information b before we get back in September. Understood. Thank would you. the gentleman yield? I'll yield with a little Dr. time. Dr. Bustani has the time. Yeah, I'll yield. Yes, that's what I meant. Uh, thank you so much for your comment. You indicated that this was an oversight uh, hearing which you had a response. I asked the gentleman, is it your intention to improve the law as it relates to so-called Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act? I, is I that believe your the, purpose? Rec to improve rec reclaiming it my time, I believe the law is so deeply flawed, I favor repeal and All replacing right. it. Time has expired. Mr. Roskam's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this reminds me of this scene at the end of the first Indiana Jones movie. <clears throat> 
where Indiana Jones goes in and uh, he's talking to the guy from the government. And Indiana says, uh, where's the ark? And the guy from the government at the end of the movie says, we've got top people working on it. And then the next scene is the Ark of the Covenant going into a giant government warehouse somewhere. And this exchange a little bit today, <clears throat> what I've heard from you is basically saying, we've got top people working on this. So Mr. Cohen, when you were asked by Mr. Brady a couple of minutes ago about the nature of the test, when you distilled down what you actually said, you actually said to him and to Mr. McDermott, we've got top people working on it. Mr. Werfel, when that's you not what I said. That's not what ago, I said. I paraphrase it and it's my not what I said. Mr. Werfel, when you were asked a couple of minutes ago by Mr. Ryan about the clawback, you basically said, don't worry, we've got top people working on it. And we, we have had an expectation in this committee that's actually been driven fairly low by previous witnesses. Previous administration witnesses have come in with clear-eyed assurances that everything was fine. Top people meeting deadlines, everything's AJ squared away, no problems at all. And yet today, we hear in the exchange that you had with Mr. Levin, and that's your prerogative to have an exchange with Mr. Levin. He asks you questions, you say, yes, we will. He asks you questions, yes, they will. All right, so my expectations are fairly low, but the best predictor of future future conduct is what has happened in the past. So Mr. Cohen, here's my question. You're at CMS. It is a universally accepted fact that the payment rate, the fraudulent and error payment rate at CMS on Medicare is about $40 billion. It's known as pay and chase. GAO says that. The Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, in a 2012 article in Forbes magazine actually upped the number. He said it was much higher than that. How can you, with a straight face, come in and give assurances to this committee that CMS has it all down when you're not even able to give a straight answer about the nature of the test? What, it is, what is it that animates the hope in you that you're not going to have the same problems in implementing the Affordable Care Act that clearly CMS has demonstrated it has all kinds of difficulty on Medicare. Congressman, I see absolutely no connection between the fraudulent payment rate in Medicare and the work I'm doing. None. Is that it? I don't think you, I, I, I suspect that you could have any executive of any company come in here and ask him questions about how the IT testing is done on his computer systems and what he would tell you is he's got I need to refer to you I need to refer to you to the people who really are expert rather than give you an answer that's wrong I know you don't want me to do that I gave you the best answer I can which is I know that we have testing going on and I will get back to you with response to the specific question that Mr. Brady asked, and I'm happy to do that. Thank you for doing that. So the question is, what is it that animates your hope that the activity of your agency, that everybody says has this type of fraud rate? You agree with that, don't you? I, I'm not, I don't work on the Medicare program, so I'm You're not, not aware of the GAO report? You're nope. not aware of the Attorney General's assertions about fraud in Medicare? That's not my job, so okay, I'm, I'm focused on my job and here's doing what some I news. need to do. You ready for some news? Here's the news. Your agency has all kinds of trouble as it relates to Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud, error in payment rates. And what you've basically said is, <clears throat> we're good. No, We've what I've said is I see no control. connection between those issues and the issues that I'm dealing with, none. All right, let me ask you a different question. You said earlier, and I jotted it down, you said earlier that the impact on the employer mandate delay is quite small. If it's so small, why hasn't it been fixed in three years? I said that it was small because of the number of employees, 96% of the larger employees who would be subject to the employer mandate already offer coverage. So the number of employers who don't offer coverage who would be subject to the mandate is relatively small. But it's a fairly complicated problem that you haven't been able to fix yet, right? It's not my responsibility. It's what is your Treasury responsibility, Mr. Cohen? 
my responsibility is to implement the provisions of the Affordable Care Act that, uh, as it relates to the private insurance market, that are uh, under the law given to the Department of Health and Human Services. That's my responsibility. And it's I not the employer mandate. You've got right. top, top people working on it. All right. I yield back. Okay. Mr. Pascrell is recognized. Welcome to uh, Guerrilla Warfare. Uh, Mr. Cohn, Mr. Werfel, thank you for being here today. I know you're answering to the best of your ability. Uh, I would imagine, uh, Mr. Cohn, and correct me if I'm wrong, since we're all here to help implement affordable health care for all American citizens, certainly not to undermine the program that is law, has been vilified by the Supreme Court in terms of mandates, we're certainly not here to undermine it. We're here to help implement it. Much like we had the problems when Medicare was first passed in the mid-60s or Social Security, both sides came together to try to help to implement the program. So if health care costs grew slower than the rest of the economy, uh, for the first time in more than a decade, and the proportion of requests from insurers to state regulators seeking approval of double-digit premium increases in private health insurance plummeted from 75 percent, correct me if I'm wrong, in 2010 to 14 percent so far in 2013. That's correct. Now, my question is this. There's the following. Do, is this because of the good feeling of insurance companies? Number two, is this simply by chance? Number three, or somebody's manipulating the numbers and all of these things are not right. Or what's the reason? So I would say there are a number of reasons, but among them are uh, the increased scrutiny that insurance company rates have been getting as a result of the Affordable Care Act. The medical loss ratio provision, or the so-called 80-20 rule, which requires that uh, insurance companies spend 80 cents of every premium dollar on actual health care costs rather than on admi uh, administrative costs or profit, which means that if, they, if their premiums are too high, they're going to have to pay a rebate back to their uh, enrollees. Let me ask you this question, uh, Mr. Werfel. Uh, one of the cornerstones of the Affordable Care Act was the availability of tax credits uh, to make premiums affordable. Can you explain very briefly what tax credits are available for individuals and families and who would qualify for those tax credits? Just give me a quick synopsis. Yeah, so if there's an individual who does not have affordable uh, health care coverage and they come to the exchange, um, if they, depending on their income level, if they're within 100 and 400 percent of the poverty line, then they would be eligible for support. Income. That's support. like a sliding scale. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. And again, and I think this is important because it goes to the question of erroneous payments. The premium subsidy that they get goes directly to the insurance company. They they never see the money, but they get a less expensive. Uh, premiums. Now, they can do it one of two ways. They can get it in advance. Right. So they can start their enrollment with the exchange and, and this new insurance company that they are now uh, a part of um, by getting money up front, money support up front paid to the insurance company, or they can pay their premiums out throughout the year and at the end of the year on their tax form file for a credit to cover the payments that they've made. Either one is available to them. Mr. Werfel, that means in New Jersey that 900 and 90,000, a little above that, 990,000 uninsured individuals uh, with family incomes under 400 percent. What's the 400 percent, Mr. Warfel? 400 percent of what? 400 percent of the poverty line. Okay. In New Jersey, they're going to be eligible for either Medicaid or subsidized coverage through the exchange. That's the difference it's going to make in the state of New Jersey. So my good friend from Washington State and my good friend from Louisiana, all good intentions, good men, good people who have brought a lot to this committee and a lot to the, to the Congress of the United States, they're not here to help imp us implement this legislation. 
because we know there's going to be kinks. There's always problems with every piece of legislation. We've never passed the perfect piece of legislation in the Congress. Only God is perfect, not the Congress. So we try our best to get the best in front of us and what can pass. That's where we are. Why aren't we helping each other trying to get this done? I can't answer that question. It's a mystery to me because they've never denied any of the positive data that we've put before, anybody's put before, with the results of what's happened with ACA already. Never denied any of those the facts. The gentleman's Not time one has fact. expired. While Mr. you're Gerlach giving people recognized. more time on the other side, Mr. I only took 30 seconds. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gerlach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to offer into the record an August 1, 2013 letter from the National Treasury Employees Union. Without objection. Thank you. Um, Mr. Werfel, uh, the information that the IRS will start gathering uh, related to the Affordable Care Act and taxpayer information related to the Affordable Care Act, will the IRS consider any disclosure of that information to be a violation of Section 6103? If it's uh, yes, if any outside done, individual, if it's done outside of the appropriate rules and, and regulations. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, both Mr. Cohen and Mr. Warfel, uh, and it falls up on the question that Mr. Pascrell just asked relative to who's eligible for uh, the tax credits that will be available through these exchanges. Uh, it was my understanding it was just going to be those that are citizens of the United States or here as permanent legal residents. Are there folks beyond that that are eligible for uh, tax credit, taxpayer subsidies under this program? You have to be a citizen or lawfully present. Lawfully present. What does that mean? Well, you could be here on a student visa and be eligible. Okay. So a student from Germany comes to the United States to do four years of college. That student is going to be subsidized by taxpayers for health insurance? They are eligible for subsidies depending on their income, yes. Okay. Somebody comes here to the United States on a travel visa, has a visa for a certain period of time, a number of months, uh, and perhaps wants to stay longer. Will that person be able to apply for uh, tax-subsidized uh, insurance coverage while here? Well, if they overstay the visa, then no. But they're able to apply while they're here legally, lawfully? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, are there any other individuals, one, uh, a battered spouse, child, or parent that might be from another country? Is that person eligible for uh, this subsidy? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I'm looking at the list of eligible immigration status list on page 20 of Appendix B that's on your website as to those that are eligible for this program. And one of the categories is battered spouse, child, or parent. I'm just not familiar with that particular status. Because the reason I'm asking, um, who makes that determination that the person was in fact battered and therefore becomes eligible for the program? And how are you setting up the regulations in this program to have the kind of verification that the people that are applying for the subsidies are actually eligible based upon the structure of the program? How are you going to the, verify that? The verification of uh, immigration status is done uh, through uh, data from the Department of Homeland Security. Okay. All right. And I know a few other of my colleagues have asked about their particular states. I'm from Pennsylvania, from the southeastern part of the state. And it will be a federal exchange established in Pennsylvania. Do you know the status of that exchange? And will it, in fact, be up and running October the 1st in Pennsylvania? Yes, it will. Okay. And we work very closely, by the way, with the Pennsylvania Insurance Department. Have the rate filings uh, been offered and submitted to CMS uh, as part of the establishment of that exchange? Issuers have submitted uh, qualified health plans to be certified to be offered on the exchange of Pennsylvania, yes. And that so includes, will, the, will the average family in my district see the $2,500 reduction in their premium? I, I can't speak to what the rates are going to be. The, that information will be um, made public in September. Will Pennsylvania, you indicate in your testimony that come August the 15th, I guess, in about two weeks, grants will be issued for the Navigator program. Will anybody in Pennsylvania receive any of Navigator grant monies, do you know? Uh, 
I haven't seen, I'm, I'm not involved in the grant award process for reasons that I'm sure you can appreciate, but my understanding is there will be navigators in Pennsylvania. Do you know how many navigators in Pennsylvania? The law says that we should have at least two, uh, and I expect that there will be at least two. Okay. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Price is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for, for holding this, um, this hearing. This is really an important issue, and uh, uh, it, it is our our intention uh, to make certain that the American people have the highest quality health care available to them. And our concern is that this law is making it more difficult for them to have access to the highest quality of care. Uh, as a physician, before I got uh, to Congress, I can tell you that, that my former colleagues are, are much having increasing concern about their ability to care for their patients in the way that, that they deem most appropriate. We hear from our friends on the other side that there aren't any alternatives. I just keep reminding them about H.R. 2300, which is a comprehensive piece of legislation. Patient-centered health care puts patients and families and doctors in charge of, of health care, not Washington, D.C. Senator Baucus described uh, or, or said he was worried about the, the rollout of this being a train wreck. And, and what we're seeing today is uh, uh, a documentation of this train wreck. I think there's no doubt about it, as my colleagues have, have, have alluded to in, many, in so many areas. Mr. Cohen, you said that your job uh, is to administrate the private insurance market as it interfaces with the ACA. Um, now, I know that you haven't seen the... Is that fair? That's not exactly what I said, but What's that's okay. Job? My job is to implement the provisions of the Affordable Care Act as they pertain to the private insurance market. Private insurance market. There you go. I know you haven't seen the Atlanta Journal-Constitution today. Not many people have. This is the headline in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution today. Insurance options shrink. Subheadline, Georgia online marketplace to offer fewer choices for some consumers. Parts of the state are going to have one insurance company. One. Aetna and Coventry have announced that they're pulling out of the individual market in the, in, in, for the exchanges. That's not the way this was supposed to work. Clearly, access to care, access to, to coverage is being limited uh, in the state of Georgia, and I suspect it's, it, it, it's true in other no, states. No, the that cost, doesn't follow. That doesn't the, follow, though, because they're it, 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 Mr. Cohen, there are areas of our state that will have one insurer offering coverage in the exchange. That's not an option. That's a demand. That's a dictate. That's forcing individuals into one program. Let's get to cost. We had a stakeholder call yesterday with CMS and, and HHS highlighting that the exchange in the state of Georgia is on track, their words, on track. State Insurance Commissioner, Mr. Hudgens, has sent a letter to uh, Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius stating that some rates in our state are increasing up to 198 percent higher than those plans currently available in the state. So if the state exchange is on track, is this how it was supposed to work? Are we supposed to have 198 percent increases for individuals in our state for the purchase of health coverage? Is that the plan, Mr. Cohen? It's not, but I don't know what Commissioner Hudgens is referring to, so I can't comment as You've to seen the rate filings for our state, haven't you? I, I, have, I have not seen the rate filings for Georgia. Your office has seen the rate filings the for The rate us. filings have been filed with us, yes. So I would urge you to please check the rate filings for the state of Georgia. And, and, the, and the fact of the matter is that costs are going up for individuals, not $2,500 decrease for, for uh, families, as the President promised uh, the American people. Mr. Werfel, you said many of my constituents are real concerned about the IRS and the activity that's gone on so far, and you were here earlier in documenting the concerns that you had about targeting organizations that were applying for tax-exempt status, about the, the, the potential leaking of donor information to other groups, and we've got huge concerns and we'll continue this conversation about donors that, that were providing resources to those organizations then being targeted for audits. You said no personal health information will ever be disclosed. That's what you said today. We don't have any access to personal health information. I suspect if you were here a couple years ago, you would have said that no targeting of tax-exempt groups or do donors will ever occur. So you understand the, 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 the concern that we have. 
I want to ask a question about this whole issue of marketplace. You've said that the IRS shares information with 300 different agencies, and you've said it only will share this information with the marketplace. What's the marketplace? That's the exchange. So, so the, anybody that has access to information through the exchange will have access to no. taxpayer information? No, there's procedures and controls in place to make sure, for example, if someone's on a screen in the exchange working with uh, this information, they won't have access to the raw taxpayer data. The only way the raw tax data can surface is if the individual taxpayer gives consent. Just like there were procedures in, 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 in place to make certain that tax-exempt organizations weren't targeted. All right. Thank you. Mr. Crowley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Werfel, are you both familiar with the word irony? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Can I enter into the record a definition? I, I got off the Internet. The use of the words to convey a meaning that is the opposite of its literal meaning, an expression or utterance marked by a deliberate contrast between apparent and intended meaning. The hearing notice we received, a hearing on st status of the Affordable Care Act implementation. I would actually think my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are interested in how the Affordable Care Act will be implemented. Yet tomorrow, we will have the 40th attempt to undo the Affordable Care Act, to derail it. And in fact, they will go after, Mr. Warfel, your agency and deny funding to your agency for the purposes of carrying out what is your responsibility under the law, under the Affordable Care Act. Is that not true? That's my understanding. Do you think that's ironic that we're having this hearing today? I'm not sure how to answer that question. I, I'll answer it in this way. The, in the nature of the questions that I've been uh, taking, like, for example, how do we address issues related to potential fraud, hmm. my goal has always been to partner with Congress. You think they would actually issues. care about the implementation of this bill? I'd like to partner with this entire committee on solutions the IRS can to deploy. Mr. Werfel, Mr. Cohen, fraud. do you know what I think? I think they realize that maybe they won't be successful tomorrow in actually undermining the Affordable Care Act. That they may have a one-house bill that once again would do away with the Affordable Care Act, but it will not become law. And somehow, they must know that the implementation of this law maybe is important to the American people. But they once again tomorrow will fail the American people and themselves when they're not successful in actually undoing this law. But they have a responsibility, I guess, to ask the proper questions about the implementation. What I find is really ironic in many respects, is that my colleague uh, from Illinois, Mr. Ryan, was concerned about the true-up. Yet their side of the aisle has attacked uh, the ability of the middle class and the working people in this country to access the tax credits to the Affordable Care Act on a number of occasions. Never once have I heard them stand up and defend the interests of the working people of this country who, are the, for the first time, many of them, have the ability to afford health insurance in this country. Um, Mr. Cohen, in terms of what would be helpful for Congress to aid with smooth implementation, are 40 repeal votes what you would consider being, re uh, being productive? Uh, I don't think they move the ball forward in terms of my job, no. And uh, I'll ask this question of both you, uh, Mr. Cohen, and Mr. Werfel. Will tomorrow's 40th repeal vote to block tax credits from going to working families help with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act in any way? No. I don't think it'll have any impact. Mr. Cohen, I'd like to, uh, to clarify one of the issues brought up earlier. There was talk of the hub that will verify transactions in the marketplace. Can you clarify, will any personal data be stored on the hub? No, the hub just routes uh, information from the secure data sources, IRS, Social Security, et cetera, so that, it, so that we can verify information that people put on their applications. Mr. Cohen, would you say that uh, members of Congress can be of assistance to their constituents as enrollment in Marketplace gets underway? Absolutely. It would be wonderful if all members of Congress would put out 
uh, helpful, accurate information for their constituents so that they can understand the benefits of the law and how to uh, And members of Congress would be, an, would be a good resource for their constituents uh, with questions or to help direct them to resources. Wouldn't you agree? Definitely. When the uh, Medicare Part D bill was passed, and I voted against it, and we went through a political charade of almost four hours on the floor to pass the bill, and a lot of political arm twisting uh, took place. I didn't agree with, the, with that bill. I fought against the bill's passage. But when it came to implementation, I never once uh, didn't help a constituent access uh, the benefits, uh, although, although I thought limited, uh, to that particular bill. Do you think it would be wrong if members of Congress were not to help their constituents uh, with the implementation of a law when enacted? If I, asked. I would hope and expect that all members of Congress would help their constituents get the benefits of the Affordable Mr. Care Act. Mr. Werfel, will you agree as well? Uh, I'm not going to comment on, on, on how the, the member deals with their constituents. I appreciate, I appreciate that. Mr. Mr. Chairman, well, my time is up. I will yield back. All right. Mr. Smith is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Cohen, Mr. Werfel. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, in the context of my uh, uh, questions uh, is my concern that uh, the health care law uh, will actually uh, hurt the very individuals it was intending uh, to help. Uh, but Mr. Cohen, uh, can you uh, briefly explain the training for these navigators? Uh, how, how long do you anticipate this training to take? Sure. Um, it's an online course, a series of courses. Uh, it's expected to take about 20 hours. Uh, that's comparable to what uh, many states require <coughs> insurance agents and brokers to do uh, before they're licensed uh, to be able to be insurance agents and brokers, and it will now cover... Now, the, the licensees in the private sector are required to take exams and maintain continuing education, and I, I would argue that it, it's a, a little more uh, burdensome than, than just a, a 20-hour training course. Well, so um, the training course includes a series of tests as the as you go through the the, the material. So you do act, you do have to answer questions and 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 you know be successful in passing those tests in order to get to the end. And okay, thank you, Mr. Werfel. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the protection of private information uh, remains an unresolved issue uh, at uh, at your agency. Uh, are you confident that these uh, data hubs can can truly protect private information? I mean, I would expect you to say yes, uh, but do, are there not unresolved issues relating to private information? Uh, let me answer it this way. We have, a, I mentioned earlier, we have a strong track record here. Let me put some numbers to that. Of I, I said earlier that we provide under normal uh, operating business and under the law, taxpayer information to 300 federal and state agencies. That is 8 million records a year. Okay, last year we know of uh, uh, 24 incidences of this type of uh, breach where the information got into the wrong hands. So that's 24 out of 8 million. Now, every single one of those 24 incidences is concerning. And every time one of them happens, we make an assessment in terms of whether it was advertent or inadvertent, and we have a lot of reaction to try to churn and make improvements. The point I'm making is that we have historical track record of success in establishing safeguards to protect this information. It's imperfect, but where there's a breach, we take our responsibilities very seriously to correct them going forward. But it, it, some of those, many of those situations remain an unresolved issue. Is that accurate? Uh, in some cases, where they're still being investigated. In some cases, we may be still evaluating what changes we need to make to prevent them from happening again. Okay. Now, uh, we heard earlier that uh, perhaps there would be some subsidies offered individuals uh, through their insurance plan, uh, but uh, certainly an undue subsidy uh, would exist. And the necessity to recapture that undue subsidy, uh, can you tell us briefly how that would be recaptured? Well, I think there was two, there was two things. There's um, you apply for a subsidy and you provide certain income information and you're essentially predicting what your income information is going to be if you're applying for an advanced credit. You're saying when I get to file my taxes in 2015 for the 2014 It's based tax on year, prospective income, correct? Yeah, you need to. And that could change. That, that could, could change. Increase. So you're relying on recent data to try to make a projection of what your income is going to be when you're applying for an advanced credit. So after we go through the whole year, now we know at the end of that year as the taxpayer is sitting down to file what their actual income was. And so we do a true up or a reconciliation to see maybe they should have been given more premium support, maybe they were given too much, and would, then we'll do that true up and, and work it out with the taxpayer. Would you characterize that recapture as a tax increase? Um, it could be that the taxpayer could owe more. It could mean that they could be due a, a higher refund. It depends on the situation. Would you characterize that as a tax increase? 
Um, I don't think I would call it a tax increase, no. Um, because the individual's coming in for a benefit. It might be a smaller benefit than they anticipated, but it's a benefit. Okay. Uh, I mean, we, we heard uh, last year, I think it was, uh, that uh, in the repeal of the 1099 mandate, uh, the pay for was a recapture of the subsidies, undue subsidies in the exchange, and, and uh, we were told in a, a, a pretty loud tone that that would be a tax increase. I certainly would dispute I, I mean, that. There might be a way, we might be just talking past each other in terms of characterization. It's real money. Will the gentleman yield? It, I, I, my time is limited, thank you. Um, but my concern so, is that there, this creates confusion. Uh, it, it adds to the complexity, and certainly as, as the exchange of information is uh, is out there and increased, uh, that increasing exchange of information, the more errors uh, will occur. So thank you. I yield back. Thank All right. Thank you. Mr. Paulson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, obviously, the law is complex and confusing in many respects. Uh, Mr. Cohen, until July 2nd, which is just earlier this month, the administration was telling all individuals who work more than 30 hours a week, we're going to make your employer, your employer, provide health care coverage. And if they don't, you will get health care and a subsidy on the exchange. No, that's not true. Large employers. Large employers. Okay. Now that's Small no employers are never subject. Okay. And that's, but that's no longer true for 2014, right? An employer does not have to offer coverage anymore. That's true. But as I've said, 96% okay. of them already do. But many our individuals, uh, so these individuals are not going to have to go to the exchange in, in, in 2014, all next year, in order to get coverage. And a lot of these folks have already seen their hours slashed, they're cut back, businesses are attempting to comply with the 30-hour rule. I've even heard from, in my, in my district, cities that are concerned about volunteer fire departments that are now, it's affecting their ability to employ volunteer firefighters because they're on call. And there are concerns that if they're on call for over 30 hours a week or their work hours are over 30 hours a week, the city may have to provide health insurance, and that could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. That seems unlikely to me. Well, these are also other concerns that are being raised now as a part of the complexities uh, of, of the law. Uh, clearly, that's out there. That seems so, like an unlikely scenario. And, and I'll follow up with you on that to make sure that we can clarify. You're talking about a volunteer. I, for that city. Now, again, this is confusing. It's disruptive to people's lives. I mean, is this fair for employers uh, or their employees that are trying to comply with this 30-hour rule? People have had their hours cut back. Uh, we are going to uh, make it possible for millions of people who have been unable to have insurance previously get health insurance. That's what we're doing. M Mr. Werfel, um, let me ask you this, uh, because you acknowledged earlier uh, that there have not been delays in some of the imp implementations of the various taxes and revenue raisers uh, that have gone forward that the IRS administers. And the IRS has not delayed the medical device tax, of course which the Joint Committee on Taxation says the costs from which are going to be passed on to consumers and passed on to businesses in the form of higher premiums. Has the IRS done any analysis at all as to the financial or the administrative impact that is being placed on firms due to the tax? Uh, we would certainly look at administrative impacts because part of our, our goal is to help work with taxpayers to reduce burden and give them electronic services and all the kinds of things we do with taxpayers to improve their taxpayer service with the IRS. Does the IRS have any sense of the problems that have been faced by some of the companies in trying to comply with the tax so far? The taxes like medical device? Medical device tax about? specifically? I, I would, I'd want to get back to you. I can talk to my team about anything they're hearing in terms of specific problems. I don't know them at my fingertips. Okay. In addition to the cost of the tax, would you agree that the cost of compliance, uh, as the Joint Committee on Taxation say, would also have a negative impact on patient care? That is a, that is a, that's a policy call. I, I really can't make a judgment on that. I know that recent surveys among the companies that have had to comply with the tax have indicated that the cost for just the compliance side, not on the revenue aspect of it, because we passed the $1 billion mark earlier this month, but the compliance costs have been estimated to be anywhere around $667 million, actually, $667 million so far. That's in addition to the billions of dollars that are being diverted from maintaining, creating good quality jobs and high-tech innovation, et cetera, and research and development. Um, and Mr. Cohen, let me just do one follow-up, too, because you mentioned you've seen the rate filings in the different states. Now, is Minnesota set to comply for October 1st for having their exchange ready? Yes, Minnesota is operating a state-based exchange, and they're uh, doing well, and it will be operating in Minnesota. Okay. Have you seen the rate filings, or has your office seen the rate filings for the plans being offered in Minnesota? We, we wouldn't have since it's a state-based state exchange. That's the state is running the exchange. They'll make them public whenever they make them public. Okay. 
can you say wh whether the average typical family would see a reduction in their premium of, again, the 2,500 hour, which is the typical family? I, I don't know what the rates are going to be in Minnesota, no. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. All right. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank the witnesses for being here. You know, I've listened to the discussion all morning, and it came to my mind that I've never seen the implementation of a new system, a new program, or a new law that covers the entire country without there being some glitch or some glitches. It also occurred to me that the only perfection that I've ever seen were Egyptian mummies. And of course, they didn't move. They remained as they were. I would imagine that if we were to ask <coughs> one of the more than 30 million individuals who until now had no access to health insurance, if any of the reasons that we've heard this morning would be a reason to do what I call throw out the baby with the bathwater, because it's not as clear as we would like for it to be. I think the debate, and of course tomorrow we will vote on something, and we will not necessarily vote on what we are hearing today, because that's not exactly the purpose. Today we are looking for perfecting ideas. I mean, how do we make the Affordable Care Act more effective? How do we improve it? How do we make sure that there are fewer glitches as the implementation occurs. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Cohen, uh, if we look at what has already taken place, I, I, I mean, not what we're talking about will happen in the future, but we've already seen a slowdown in health care cost growth in both national health spending and in Medicare. This week, the Council on Economic Advisors announced the slowest growth in health spending in 49 years. The only thing that I've heard year after year after year after year has been the increase in cost of health care, that, that we're spending more money and getting less. I'm told that insurance companies now must spend at least 80% of their premiums on medical care, not other kinds of things. In 2012, Americans have saved $3.4 billion. That's a lot of money, even in Chicago, Illinois, where I live. That's a lot of money. $3.4 billion saved, and another $500 million in rebates. Could you share some additional kinds of benefits that, that we've already seen from the Affordable Care Act? Uh, certainly, I'd be happy to. Uh, 3.1 million young people age 26 and below who've been able to get insurance through their uh, parents' uh, employer coverage. 71 million Americans who've gotten expanded access to preventive services at no cost uh, to them. Uh, 27 million women of, uh, included in that who've gotten uh, guaranteed access to additional preventive services without cost sharing. 17.6 million children uh, who have pre-existing conditions and now can't be denied insurance coverage as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Let me tell you, those kind of benefits, I mean, we can nitpick about verification. We can nitpick about anything that we come up with. 
but the reality is the American people want to see implementation of the Affordable Care Act, and that's what we're going to get. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Marchant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for three years now, we have been monitoring in our office the phone calls, uh, the emails, and the letters uh, about the Affordable Health Care Act. Ninety-five percent of the correspondence that I get from my constituents is against Obamacare. It's against the implementation. So as a representative of my district, uh, some of the questions I'll ask are going to reflect that. Uh, when I look at this application and have like looked through the entire application and have listened to the testimony that we've had today, and I want to thank the chairman for having this implementation hearing, I'm finding out that not only after my constituents are told that they're going to be breaking the law if they don't have health insurance, and if they don't take and fill out this application, they're going to owe a penalty. And then they get into the middle of this application and they find out that this application asked them for some very, very personal information and asked them about actually almost every bit of their financial life. Now, my constituents are very alarmed right now with all of the headlines about uh, information being shared about their phone records information being shared about their emails. Uh, they're alarmed. They're concerned that the government is learning way too much about their private lives and that the government's sharing way too much of that information. You can't be anything but alarmed after going through this application and then hearing today in this hearing that this information is going to be shared with state insurance agencies, it's going to be shared, it's going to be gathered by navigators who may be making 10 or 12 bucks an hour. Uh, it's going to be shared with private insurance carriers and that these no. private insurance carriers are going to be able to access information from the IRS and they're alarmed. And nowhere in this document does it say that by law the Supreme Court has said that you do not have to take this uh, insurance that you can in fact pay a penalty. Con Congressman, I, I'd like to work with you to ease your constituents' concerns because no one has to provide any information about themselves unless they want a benefit, unless they want a subsidy. They don't have to provide any information whatsoever. What the law says is your individual personal responsibility is to have health insurance In coverage. order to follow the law, they must fill out this application. Well, I, I hope you'll explain be, to them that's not true. Or be in violation of the law and pay well, a penalty. I hope you'll Most explain to them that's not true, because it's not in true. America want to follow the law. They want to do the right thing. And they're going, and I believe, will go to this application because they feel like they must to follow the law. The application asks whether you want to receive a subsidy, and then if you say yes, you go on to provide income information. If you don't want to receive a subsidy from the government to help pay for your health insurance, you don't have to tell us anything. But go out and buy health insurance. If a responsible family fills this application out, how can it be assured that this information will not be shared with some clerk at Aetna Insurance Company, and that that clerk will have access to go to the IRS and find out whether the information you gave and that is correct. You, you or can some navigator sitting out in a tax exempt organization that's got a contract. You can ensure ensure them that Aetna Insurance Company will never see their personal information with respect to the, what their income is. Never, based on filling out this application. But we've had they don't get it. Money today that says that the number of people that are going to receive. Uh, personal IRS information is going to be significantly expanded and you're saying that only if you desire this benefit will you then de facto be, gi be giving permission for this information to be shared. I I'm, I'm reflecting the concern of the people that live in my district 
And, and I'd like to help you alleviate that concern because it's based on a misunderstanding of how this why works. Why does at the very end of this The insurance company doesn't get this application. Why at the very end of this application does it give instructions on how a person can go register to vote? Because Congress passed a law that says that whenever the federal government provides a benefit to people, it needs to provide an opportunity to, how to, to know how to register My to vote. It's called the Motor Voter Law. Also need to provide That's a law that Congress passed, in here. and we follow it. A person does not have to fill this application out by law. All right, thank you. Time's expired. Ms. Black. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for having this very important hearing. Uh, Mr. Cohen, I want to just get right into the questions because just three weeks ago, um, we had by rule a statement that said you were not ready to fully verify income. Um, what has changed in those three weeks? What's changed is that we've looked at our process uh, and we have uh, confirmed that we are able to uh, verify income for 100% uh, of the applicants who will be submitting applications to the marketplaces. You can verify for 1 to 2 percent? 100 percent. 100 percent. Yes, we will be um, verifying. So if that is the case, I'm just really curious how in just three weeks, um, with a rule being put out just three weeks ago to say we do not have the technology to be able to do that, and yet three weeks later we're now seeing, oh, all of a sudden we have the technology to do that. How no. Did that happen? That's not right. We said we were going to okay. sample and now we've concluded that the sample size is going to be 100 percent. So yes. we always said we were going to do we were going to do it. We just said we were going to do some. Now I we're don't have the do rule all. right in front of me, Mr. Cohen, but it did say that you did not have the technology to implement. And I don't have it right in front of me. But let me go to your next. Let me go to my next point. Um, on April the 12th, here in this committee, in a Ways and Means Committee, Secretary Sebelius claimed 15 times there would be no further delay in this law. And yet the 1st of July, we got a rule that said there would be a delay of the employer mandate and that there would be a delay in the income verifications. And I just find that really interesting that 15 times in our committee that we're not going to have a delay. Um, and now, Mr. Warfel, um, you claim that you're making efforts to verify the employer-sponsored coverage. Um, making efforts, and Mr. Cohen, you now tell us that tomorrow we're going to receive a new rule on the income verification. Uh, we're 60 days out. I don't think you all are ready. I really don't believe you're ready by what you're telling us here, that you are making efforts. This is three years worth of work, and we were told by the Secretary there would be no more delay. So I think that you can't have it one way and then uh, something else come up. But let me, let me go to Mr. Cohen on this one. Um, can you tell me what the role of Equifax and other contractors will be uh, on these recently signed contracts that you have with them on verifying and providing 100 percent? Sure. E Equifax is a source of data uh, from employers. Uh, that we, we will be uh, uh, checking the information that people put on their application against uh, in circumstances where we can't verify the information uh, that's been provided from IRS data. Um, we will check it against Equifax data because that's a current source of how much people are getting earning um, that exists not for all employers, but for many employers. So it's another source of data that we can use to verify. So you're saying in this committee today that 100 percent of the applications that are filed will have a verification of their income through whatever source, whether it's Equifax, you have another contract beside Equifax. And then if we can't verify against the sources that we have available, then we request documentation from the individual. They'll have to provide us, for example, with pay stubs. Okay, so quickly I want to go, because I know my time's going to run out here, I want to go to the whole clawback, because uh, Mr. Cohen, you mentioned earlier the IRS is supposedly going to be clawing back any fraudulent payments when people file their tax returns, and somehow the administration thinks this is going to deter fraud. Um, but Mr. Warfel, this question is for you. Can you please explain to the committee to what degree the IRS has been able to recover re uh, fraudulent payments that have been made through similar advanced tax credits? Um, in the Earned Income Tax Program and also the Educational Tax Credit? 
Well, a couple of things um, in terms of the clawback to clarify, because there's a difference between the earned income tax credit and here. And again, I made the point earlier. The taxpayer doesn't actually receive funds. The funds go to the insurance provider. That. And that's important because... But that's because still money that goes out the door. I agree. Those are I federal total, dollars that the hardworking taxpayer is paying. And that's a, and, and I know my time's going to run out here, but $11 billion were fraudulently doled out by the Inspector General's report um, in the earned income tax credit, $11 billion a year and $3 billion in the education tax credit. And he testified in this very committee that, and these are his words, incredibly unsuccessful in clawing back that money. So I know we're running out of time. Let me commit to work with your staff, if you'll allow, to explain the procedures that we have in place to get money returned to the IRS and earned income tax credit and how we're going to work in the ACA. Would you please do that in I running? Will. Because as I said, this is absurd. We're 60 days out from full implementation. Three years later, we're still rewriting this train wreck. And it's right. time that this administration admits it's not ready and we need to delay this train right. wreck. And okay, Mr. I Werfel, back. I realize you're relatively new to the position, but I want you to know with these um, improper payments, I have been raising that issue with the previous commissioners of the IRS for several years and not gotten concrete proposals on how this committee might be able to address the problem of improper payments. And that's why there's a concern here. But and it, my commitment would extend to you and your staff as well to roll up sleeves and talk about the issue. Absolutely. Right. Mr. Larson. I thank the chairman and I thank our witnesses for being here uh, this morning and uh, I want to commend our chairman uh, as this committee has conducted business over the last several, uh, uh, this past year in fact and before that for the bipartisan nature of which we have done things together. This hearing however today does not take on that same feeling. In fact, I'll bet at one point or another um, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Werfel might have felt like this was part of an inquisition rather than a hearing, but I assure you there are no Torquemundas uh, on the other uh, side. They are indeed good people. Uh, and it's uh, uh, unfortunate that uh, like as we're working on tax reform, we couldn't be working on constructing the Affordable Health Care Act in a way that it serves people. Just quickly, without the Affordable Health Care Act, all of the provisions that you talked about that people are currently enjoying, what would happen to them? They would not be there or available to the 3.1 million people who receive uh, specific benefits, 17.6% uh, of children, 71 million in preventative care for the elderly. That would all be, all be gone, correct? If the law were to be repealed, yes. If it were to be repealed. the goal here is to repeal. There is no substitute. There is no replacement. What would insurance costs be without this act? What was the trend with respect to insurance costs? Insurance costs, uh, health insurance costs were going up at a much higher rate before than they are now. That is in fact true. And so now with the exchange coming on, the heart, the truth of the matter here is that what we have is not something uh, that CMS oversees, like Medicare, which is a single payer, and many on our side would have preferred either a single payer system or Medicare for all system. What we have is an amalgamation of different systems, but it's primarily the seed of an idea that was put forward by the Heritage Foundation, an idea that was then implemented by a Republican governor in a Democratic state, and as you heard Mr. Neal say, done very successfully because Democrats and Republicans worked together in order to put this through. And now we have an opportunity to take the very best of public health, the very best of science, technology, and innovation, and the very best of entrepreneurialism and drive down the most inefficient business in this country, which is health care delivery. I repeat, the most inefficient business and so we have the tools and the techniques that the other side should be joining with us to use that, by the way, would drive down the national debt, would make health care more accessible, affordable, and create a new paradigm where patient outcome and wellness is the goal, not so much the delivery in a hodgepodge manner. And it's because the private sector now is coordinating care under the Affordable Health Care Act that we see the tremendous opportunity for great gain. 
But instead, here in Congress, we persist on playing taste great, less filling, see yet the 40th time that a bill is going to be repealed, dragging before us again people from the various agencies instead of saying, how can we work together trying to play gotcha and what's going to go wrong within the agency? The American people are fed up with this. We're going to go through this charade one more time before we exit because it's a political point that has to be made. But what the American people want to see is affordable health care, is the deficit paid off. We have the framework, the context to do it. My God, Mr. Chairman, let's work together to get this done. Let's use these agencies. Let's not go after these people who are trying as hard as they can to get an act in front of the American people that will allow them and assist them to get the health care coverage that they need. This is a good thing for the American people, and it's something that we should be working on together, not fighting with one another over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you. Mr. Young is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. I'm concerned about the adverse impact that the Affordable Care Act is going to have on our hourly employees. Um, there's been a discernible and dramatic shift from full-time to part-time work uh, in recent months. Uh, schools, colleges, cities, and restaurants throughout my district in Indiana uh, have reported this on the ground to me, but this is not just anecdotal evidence that I have. Um, you look at the national trends, according to the Labor Department, since January, roughly 100,000 fewer Americans are working full-time. Uh, the June jobs report indicates that 322,000 uh, people uh, have seen an increase. Uh, there's, been, there's been an increase in 320, by 322,000 people uh, of, of Americans who want to work full-time but can only find part-time work. So why is, what's driving this trend? Um, it is the Affordable Care Act in large measure. You have employers that are chopping up their full-time positions into part-time positions so that they can stay under that 30-hour threshold, which is mandated under the so-called employer mandate. An employer mandate's driving up costs on businesses, uh, estimated according to our federal government of $106 billion. And, you know, there, there are a number of people who are living from paycheck to paycheck that I talk to on a regular basis who are not just hurting, uh, but they're angry. They're angry at those uh, who put this law into place and those who are implementing it, and they want, uh, they want reforms. And so I do come here in the spirit of partnership to try and identify those reforms. I, I would note that President Obama has already signed seven of the so-called partisan and meaningless bills, which he, on a regular basis, uh, despises uh, uh, in, in his speeches. Uh, he's responded to the employer community by delaying the employer mandate. These are both actions that the President has taken. I wish he would also extend mandate relief to individual rank-and-file Americans and their families by uh, also delaying the individual mandate. But I'm going to ask you a few pointed questions here. Do you think that the administration could support, as another possible measure, repealing the new definition of full time of 30 hours, which it's never been uh, popular, popularly understood to be, and restoring the tr traditional 40 hour definition uh, as it applies to this act? I, I, I'll start by saying I'm just not the right government official to answer that question. I think uh, I would defer to Treasury on those types of policy calls. Right, that's not mine either, I'm afraid. Okay. Well, the, the tax code, of course, is your forte, so I'll ask you this. Can you point to any other places within the Internal Revenue Code where full-time is defined as being 30 hours a week? I will look into that and get that answer for you. I don't know at my fingertips. Um, I believe I know the answer. Okay. Uh, I'm not the commissioner of the IRS. I'm not the guy in charge. But I think the answer is no. It's never been defined as, as 30 hours. And that's why the American people understand it to be something much higher than that. Um, do you believe a one-year delay of the employer mandate as you consult with um, your bosses 
Um, do, you, do you believe that uh, that is going to stop this trend of, of reducing the number of hours that our hourly employees are receiving from 34 hours down to, say, 29 hours, the, the so-called 29er effect? I'm not sure. I mean, what we're hearing from employers is they wanted an opportunity for two things, to talk, have more time to work with the Treasury Department and the IRS around how these regulations are constructed and how the reporting provisions will exist. And they also wanted more time to uh, develop and ramp up their technology and process solutions to meet the new requirement. Now, whether they then in turn that has other impacts on their business, I would imagine it would. I don't know what impacts it might have on their business, but the direct request we had from them is more time to both uh, work with us on the requirements themselves and give them time to develop the systems needed to meet those requirements. Well, we have another jobs report coming out on Friday and, and others to follow. So we will see whether or not uh, this uh, one-year delay has any impact on the reduction to, uh, of number of hours and thus wages of, of these uh, workers who are on the margins of our economy. Um, thank you, and I yield back. All right. Mr. Renacci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I know it's been a long day so far, but uh, Mr. Cohen, um, kind of help me out uh, with my constituents. You know, I represent a district uh, where I was a businessman there for almost uh, 28 years before coming here. You made a statement uh, that uh, I wrote down. It said health insurance rates were going up at a much higher rate than they were bef uh, when than than they have they since have, yeah um, since uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, but when I go back home and I go back to those same businesses, and I remember when I operated them, health insurance costs were going up. They were going up 7, 8, 9 percent sometimes, sometimes 11. Today, 32, 52, 63 is one of the percentages I've got from some of those businesses that I dealt with. Explain to me, tell me what I should be telling them, because you just said health care costs are going down, but that's not what, that's not what, what is happening in Ohio, by the way, well, which, as you know, is expected, premiums are expected to increase 88 percent. So obviously I, I'm talking about, you know, averages across the country. I'm not talking about a specific business in Ohio, so I can't necessarily I'm talking about to, a district, too. I'm talking or, about or a an district area. in Ohio. But what, what, one thing you can tell them that is a real benefit to uh, small businesses under the Affordable Care Act um, once it is fully implemented in 2014 are two things. Um, traditionally, businesses with high, in higher risk types of employment, say construction workers, the uh, cost of health care coverage for them was extremely high because they could be uprated based on an industry factor. You can't do that anymore beginning in 2014. The second thing is that for smaller employers, if you had one employee with high health costs, you could be uprated because of the health condition of that one employee. Can't do that anymore after 2014. So there are some benefits that are going to come into effect um, starting next year. They're going to have a real uh, significant impact on the cost of coverage for small business. So you would, you're saying, hold on, it's coming, even though they're experiencing all these high rates. Well, not all the provisions have gone into effect, but beginning in 2014, these will. All right, again, just so we know, I mean, that's the, co the kind of the comments you've been making today is in general costs are coming down. I'm afraid my, my district's not experiencing that. Uh, Mr. Werfel, regarding the data hub, you know, my constituents, my colleagues, I'm even somewhat concerned. Uh, we're talking about sensitive uh, taxpayer information, being prepared for October 1st, you know, having this all ready. You've said you're going to have everything ready October 1st, correct? With respect to the transmission of tax data through the hub to the exchanges, yes. Would you be willing to uh, demo that system for members of this committee in uh, September before, it's, uh, before you implement it? I would consult with my staff to make sure that something like that can be done. But anything we can provide to provide you more information on how the process will work and to give you assurances about what we're doing, I'm committed to that. Well, if it's ready to go October 1st, you're saying it's going to be ready to go October It is absolutely 1st. ready to go to October 1st. Yeah, I, I think we Unless just have to work out what you mean by demo, but yes, we will get you what you need in order to understand exactly how the process works, and we'll work in terms of what the demo looks like, but yes, I'm committed to, to do that. So sometime in September we could expect that? Yes, uh, we'll work with our, I'll have my staff work with yours. Can you tell me how much the department has spent uh, to date to implement this new system? I do have... Uh, statistics uh, for the various costs of the systems. Um, th there are a variety of different uh, systems involved, but as an example, um, 
you know, in terms of the transactional portal, the gateway for uh, data passing to and from IRS, 3.1 million spent to date. I mean, I can go through all the numbers, but I think what might be helpful is for me to just give you a rack up, uh, a detailed rack up of cost to date or by fiscal year, and I can provide that information to you. Right. I'd appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Cohen, can you explain, I know um, you've said a number of times that the exchanges will be ready to go on October 1st. Um, what's the backup plan if they're not? Do you have a backup plan or is there, I mean, well, there, there is no if not. I mean, the, 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 the people will be able to, uh, you know, go online and submit their data and, and, and enroll in coverage. Uh, there are, um, you know, we will be sure uh, that um, the opportunity to get enrolled in the coverage will be available. I mean, so there, no backup plan? Well, we, 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 we have a lot of different procedures in place to make sure that that's possible, but there is no, it's not going to work. It's going to work. All right, and Mr. Cohen, you have said a number of times today, too, that you're going to do 100% verification of income. Right. 100%. That's a, I just want to make sure. Now, when you say that, yep. are you talking about in verification, and I'm a CPA, so sometimes <laughs> okay. verify by looking at this document, that document. You know, if someone, if, if you go to Equifax and they give you an incorrect number, but it's the number they gave you, are you going to call that verification? I'm, that's, I'm just trying to get. We are going to compare the information that the applicant gives us against available data sources: IRS, SSA, Equifax, and then we're going to see if they, if we can verify that way. If we can't, we're going to get additional information from the applicant, such as pay stubs. So a year and a half from now, if you come back, you'll be able to testify that you've verified 100 percent. Well, that's and the system we're designing. So time has expired, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm intrigued by uh, my friend from Ohio talking about 88 percent premium increases uh, because we're seeing states that are working uh, to try and implement the legislation and are doing so in aggressive and thoughtful fashion are actually seeing the opposite. Reductions in New York, reductions in California, the state of Washington. Mr. Chairman, I would like uh, unanimous consent to enter into the record What's happening in Oregon in Without terms of lower costs, better care? One of the problems in some of these states coming up with the scare tactics is people are actually not comparing apples to apples. They're not comparing health care that no longer has pre-existing conditions, no longer can cherry pick um, in terms of inadequate coverage that, we, that previously people had. Um, and I'm, I find this unfortunate, uh, but I find it entirely consistent with what's happened in this committee. When we had the prescription Medicare drug program jammed through in the middle of the night after an unprecedented arm twisting, some Republicans claimed borderline bor uh, bribery, uh, leaving the machine open for two and a half, three hours, whatever it was. Uh, and these were not our approaches and a program that wasn't paid for, unlike this. We could have sabotaged it. We could have picked away at it. But to the best of my knowledge, all of us kind of rolled up our sleeves. That was the law. There's an opportunity to give benefit to people. And we were moving forward to try and improve it. I heard some concern from my friend Mr. Ryan about what's going to happen with some of the people who may run athwart uh, the penalty provisions. They may, there may be, and I find that ironic because this committee majority actually took action to make the cliff worse, to magnify the effect of the clawback, to put more people uh, at risk of having to pay back more money. Um, there was one provision that would have eliminated it altogether. And I just, I find that emblematic of what is really sad. That for the first time we have a party committed to undermining a law, not fixing it, not refining it, 
not trying to truly clarify where the problems are and working together to solve it, but to throw sand in the gears. I mean, <laughs> the IRS is having furlough days, for heaven's sakes. I don't know any business that lays off its accounts receivable, undercutting the information, having interminable hearings, dragging thoughtful men and women who would like to be out doing their job implementing the law on pointless exercises to repeal a law that's not going to be repealed, um, and thus making it harder to have a smooth implementation, harder to give people the information, harder to work out the glitches. Nobody would have designed the bill the way it is. It's a B minus. But because of a complete collapse of the legislative process in the Senate, we had to do it through reconciliation. And then ever since, there's been this assault on its implementation. And I think that's sad. I think it's unfortunate. It shortchanges men and women around the country who would like to take advantage of the provisions. And as I will illustrate from the information I'm submitting to the record from Oregon, there's some real advantages here. It's going to be fascinating watching in a year states that have rejected money for Medicare, states that have rejected setting up their own exchanges and trying to work, compared with states that are, is going to be a, a positive benefit. I hope that this is the last time we see a concerted effort to sabotage a government program and benefits for our citizens, as opposed to refining, fixing, debating, and moving forward. But Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your having the hearing. I would ap appreciate Mr. Cohen if you could provide in writing the answer to Mr. Ryan where the hypothetical that he came up with, the young woman would be eligible to apply if she's not a dependent. Uh, if that could be made a part of the record, I see my time okay. is up. But if you could provide that for the committee, I would deeply appreciate it. I'd be happy and to. And without objection, the gentleman's information <laughs> that he'll submit to the record uh, will be allowed. And I, I do want to note to the gentleman that this is the first oversight hearing on implementation of the health care law this Congress that the committee has had, first and only so far. So with that, we'll go to Mr. Griffin and then uh, to Mr. Schock. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I appreciate it. I take this hearing uh, seriously. and. Uh, everybody up here represents about 700,000 people, and people I represent don't agree necessarily by the same margins with some of the other folks that sit up here. Uh, I represent a district where people um, oppose, in large part, this law, and that's just a fact. So when I speak, it's not Tim Griffin giving you my opinion only. I'm speaking for Americans who have grave concerns, so I think this is important to have this discussion. Uh, and you know, I've heard today talk about passing bills that have zero chance of becoming law, uh, don't want to improve the law. Well, last time I checked, uh, seven of those we've passed have become law. I'm holding the list right here. So if you doubt that we want to improve it as well as get rid of it, they're not, uh, these are not inconsistent. You, you have a long-term goal and a short-term goal. And we've passed numerous bills here that the president has signed into law, at least seven. And the biggest change, the gutting, at least for one year, of the employer mandate, that's what my bill was introduced to do. The worst the White House could say about it was that it was redundant. I wanted to comply with the law. I thought it would be better if Congress spoke on that, excuse me, on that issue. So. I take issue with the idea that, uh, that somehow uh, these bills can't become law. Uh, I think there are a lot of laws that, that people on both sides of the aisle uh, oppose, and they will work their time in Congress to repeal them. This is one of them that I'm focused on. Um, but I, I want to mention a number of things here. Sometimes I feel like the discussion is not rooted in the reality that I hear. Okay, so I'm going to get away from my opinions, get away from the opinion writers, and I just want to read some of these headlines from news stories so that 
we can all agree that this is out there around the country. I think this is important. So I'm going to just read some of these. The AP, Florida insurance officials r say rates will rise under a the ACA. Georgia insurance rates spike under Obamacare. Chattanooga business owner says Obamacare costing workers pay raises and benefits. Maryland consumers could see 25% premium increases under Obamacare. UNA asked student employees to work fewer hours. Half of Affordable Care Act call center jobs will be part-time. Obamacare to impact Franklin County workers. Wisconsin grocery store forced to cut hours due to Obamacare. White Castle on Obamacare, we may only hire part-time workers. WellPoint sees small employers dropping health coverage. Growing worries about Obamacare forcing insurers out of state markets. Full-time versus part-time workers, restaurants weigh Obamacare. Obamacare forces work hour limits for students. Brevard cuts some workers part-time hours to avoid Obamacare rules. Obamacare delay is a relief for family business, for a family business. Texas business owner facing a million dollars in annual Obamacare costs. And I have pages and pages and pages and pages, and I'll be reading these on the floor of the house tonight. But the point is, these aren't manufactured concerns. These aren't opinions. These are the Hill and the Missourian and, and Huffington Post and others. I mean, these are real news articles. So in a serious way, I'm trying to convey that a lot of our objections and concern reflect the concerns of our constituents. I hear it every day. I got a text on the way, I was over doing a one minute. On the way over here, I got a text from a constituent who has my cell phone number, most do, telling me her objections to Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act. So this is real and it's real for our constituents. And I just want to make sure that you hear that side of it. It's not all uh, Washington speak. We're communicating what our constituents are telling us, and they're scared and they're concerned. Thank you all for coming up. Appreciate your time. Okay, Mr. Schock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for your uh, patience and cooperation uh, with our questions. Um, we just start at the 30,000 foot level, Mr. Cohen. Um, your responsibility is to carry out and implement the Affordable Care Act. And um, obviously, this is a law that was uh, hotly debated, passed the Senate, passed the House, signed into law by the President, is the law of the land. Um, your responsibility as a federal employee is to carry out and implement that law. The President has um, decided, the administration, I guess I should say, the President uh, vocalized uh, his unilateral decision to uh, withhold implementation of a portion of that law, specifically the employer mandate. I'm just wondering, um, from your perspective as that federal employee, did you seek any legal counsel or uh, legal opinion on whether or not you could go ahead and not implement a portion of the law passed by Congress and instead move forward on a dictate from the President inconsistent with U.S. law? I haven't, but I would point out that portion of the law is not one of the ones that I am tasked with implementing. That portion of the law is the Treasury Department and the IRS's, not mine. And I'll, I'll answer Mr. that. Mr. Werfel. There was a t uh, I wasn't in these meetings, but there was a team of lawyers, as I understand it, who evaluated the legal issues surrounding this uh, decision on the employer provisions. So I think there was significant legal review of the issue. Can you get to us the names specifically of who, who gave that legal opinion, whether it was uh, Treasury Department uh, attorneys or whether it was um, legal staff at the White House? Who specifically weighed in on the legal interpretation to determine the executive branch could unilaterally make a decision of not upholding a U.S. law passed by Congress and signed into law by the President? I will consult with Treasury on the best way to respond okay. to your question. Thank you. I think that would be helpful. Because I think it, it, it's confusing to Americans to watch us debate laws, watch them be enacted, and then see, maybe for legitimate reasons, the President say, look, this isn't ready for implement implementation. And rather than go back to Congress and say, look, we need uh, permission to not do X, Y, or Z, uh, the executive branch simply says, we're just not going to do it. I think it, it speaks not only to the credibility of this law, but I think it also undermines 
uh, the credibility as we work on other important challenges and, and issues facing our country, whether it be immigration, uh, our national debt, and the like. That trust is so important between the executive and the judicial branch, or executive and legislative branch, as well as with the American people. Um, Mr. Werfel, uh, you mentioned in your comments earlier that um, in, in, in reference to the IRS and Treasury Union employees who wish to opt out of the exchanges, um, that you thought it was appropriate that those employees be able to stay with their current policy uh, because they're happy with them, uh, happy with their policy. Uh, I'm wondering whether or not, given the fact that there have been several thousand um, uh, uh, several thousand exemptions given out to different businesses and labor groups not to have to comply with the law, whether or not the Treasury Union employees would be able to apply for a similar exemption. I think, if I understand the issue correctly, the, 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 the federal employees and the IRS employees would not need to do that. The NTEU statement was in response to a proposed piece of legislation that would have required federal employees to move into the exchange framework. And so they were saying, we prefer not for that legislation to not pass because again, we already have affordable health care coverage and we're happy with our current, um, our current program. So there's no need for a waiver for the IRS employees as far as I understand the law today. So how would they be exempted? Or how would well, they, they, be? They, they The reality is, is that you only go to the exchange, it's an option. You go to the exchange, you have to have health insurance, right, under the law. But as a federal employee, you have health insurance, so you're covered. You, you wouldn't need to go to the exchange unless you were unhappy. But the law requires them to go to the exchange. That's the problem. No, no it, it does not. No. The so does then not. why are they? Why because are they? they? Because the, law, the proposed bill that was being considered and introduced would have had this requirement in place. It would have basically taken away the, the normal federal employee health benefit plan and required them to move to a different health benefit plan, which, which would have been through the exchanges. And they were basically saying, I don't want that law to be passed because I'm happy. So they don't want to have happen to them what's happening to Congress. Well, but because the, they were saying, because that would be, no, that would, well, yes. Yes, that's okay, right. That, yeah, all right. That's correct. That just makes it much clearer. That's correct. Thank yeah. you. Uh, finally, I just want to hit on the, the self, um, uh, self attesting. Uh, it sounds as though you've got a plan in place, Mr. Cohen, to speed up the, the, the process of being able to verify and, uh, income. I just want to very quickly throw out a few figures. In Illinois, they did the self-attesting and verification later just on the Medicaid portion, and they found just in their initial investigation 20,000 Medicaid cases, uh, 13,000 of them should not have gone on to Medicaid. Uh, they did not meet the income verification. So these people self-attested, yes, I qualify. Two-thirds of them, um, after the, the agency followed up, actually were thrown off. So I think that's a problem if we're going to uh, say yes now and verify later. Uh, and I would suggest that maybe there ought to be a way that we verify their income first before they start getting a benefit. I yield back. All Thank right. You. Time has expired. I want to thank both Mr. Cohen and Mr. Werfel for being here and being willing to answer all the questions that members of the committee put forward to you. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.